and hello we are live welcome to live uh programming here at the more freedom foundation uh today i'm joined once again by uh, john coombs of the safe for democracy podcast uh, unfortunately ernie uh has had some issues and will not be able to join us today uh, but uh, today we are discussing uh, the Vietnam War's effects on U.S. culture. It's a tremendously important issue. Uh, I think it probably makes sense to begin with a bit of a disclaimer. Um, we are going to be very focused today on the U.S. experience of the war in Vietnam. Uh, we're not uh, focusing as much as, we're not as, uh, that's the point of the program that we're doing today is to look at the United States, the imperial power, if you will, and what the Vietnam experience taught us or did not teach us, what it should have taught us, uh, perhaps. Um, but uh, this is not in any way to minimize the extraordinary horror and, and triumph of the Vietnamese people uh, in that war. Um, John, you have anything to say on that? Yeah, I mean, this is the first of these shows that Rob and I have done that's more focused on my side of things. Uh, and everybody who's heard us before knows that Safe for Democracy is a show about U.S. foreign policy disasters. So that's why the focus in this show is on the U.S. But if you want the perspective of the Vietnamese people, because as I've told Rob, some people think that I give too much perspective to the peoples that are involved in our foreign policy disasters, you can get that whole story in my show. We're like six hours into the Vietnam series right now, and we haven't even gotten to the U.S. yet. So uh, the full story, it's there. It's at safefordemocracy.com. <laughs> and I mean, just briefly, I mean, over a million people dead, uh, extraordinary ecological catastrophe wrought by um, our, uh, uh, you know, from Agent Orange to napalm to, to everything that we did to the country. Uh, it was... Uh, Honestly, just one chapter in a 25-year uh, independent struggle. Um, 46 to 75. Oh, that, uh, 29. 29-year mm -hmm. 29 independent struggle. Uh, so the, the, the story of Vietnam in this era is uh, an extraordinary one, but it is not the story that we are telling today. Um, should we, I suppose, move to introductions, uh, John? Yeah. Yeah, that works for me. Um, like I just said, I'm John Coombs. I run the Safe for Democracy podcast. Our current series is Vietnam, uh, which is going to take us from 2200 BC right up to the end of the American War and then a little bit beyond. Like, uh, I don't know if anybody knows, but the Vietnamese fought a war with the Chinese in 79. Um, our first series was on the U.S. coup in Guatemala against Arbenz in 54 and the decades of genocide that followed. Uh, and then the 54 coup, sorry, the 53 coup against Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran and the uh, consequences thereof, namely the Islamic Republic. That's at saferdemocracy.com. You can look for Safer Democracy in whatever podcast app you use, and it will be right there. Uh, the uh, episodes of John's series that I've listened to in the most detail are uh, his Iran series, and I found them uh, tremendously useful in uh, uh, sort of formatting my coverage uh, of uh, that country. Uh, my name is Robert Morris. I run the More Freedom Foundation. Uh, it is a uh, for-profit, hyper-partisan think tank uh, that is doing its damnedest uh, to prevent uh, the next world war. Uh, we here tend to think that uh, there's almost zero historical consciousness in um, most mainstream and certainly most independent uh, reporting and journalism out there, uh, so we try to provide a corrective. Uh, lately, uh, this spring, this year, um, and really throughout the life of the channel, but especially this spring, this year, we're tremendously focused on the idea of American empire and empire more broadly. And uh, uh, my specific project is right now is a book called Avoiding the British Empire uh, that attempts to apply the lessons of the uh, peak and fall of the British Empire uh, to the uh, moment that we're in right now in the United States and how we can sort of learn lessons from that experience. And one of the things that was interesting about the British experience is they had uh, a lot of opportunities to learn uh, that they passed that they passed up, thinking specifically of a disaster they had in Afghanistan in the 1840s. And uh, it's, it's interesting uh, delving into that history and realizing that Vietnam kind of plays the same role uh, in the United States. We had an excellent 
uh, education, um, a horrific education in uh, the pitfalls of uh, trying to run a large scale imperial war in, a, in an area we don't understand for aims that aren't particularly clear. And uh, for, a, for a brief moment in time, that was actually an effective check on US expansion and aggression. Uh, that moment, uh, as any viewer of uh, uh, John or my uh, content will realize and will well know, that moment is uh, long over. Um, and we're now doing very similar things in Iraq and in this coming week, it uh, seems likely that we might be doing very similar things in Syria, starting off this whole process again, uh, uh, which is quite horrifying, which is why I think it's uh, a really good time to spend some time taking a look at the uh, U.S. experience in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, I think that's well said. Uh, and for anyone who thinks, not that there's necessarily anyone who does think, but for anyone who thinks that Syria is only tangentially related because what's going on in Syria is bluster and what went on in Vietnam was geopolitics, they're uh, exactly the same. So <laughs> I don't want to uh, spoil uh, the show, my show, but I think we'll get into a little bit of uh, what exactly involved us in Vietnam and why it's not so different from what has involved us in the Middle East. So. Um, to kick off, we've, we've got an outline this time. I don't know if we'll stick to that, but uh, what we wanted to talk about first, uh, it made more sense in a three-man context, but it still makes sense now. What is our personal experience with Vietnam? What did we learn from the system, that is the educational system, and then what did we receive from the culture? Uh, I think, Rob, you've got me about like a year and a half uh, age-wise, so. <laughs> Thank here. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, John's very kind. Uh, in, in truth, I've got about a decade on John and Ernie, uh, who would have been joining us. So this actually uh, lets us tease out something that's, I think, pretty important. Uh, when I was growing up in the 1980s, and even as a kid in the 1980s, Vietnam was something that I was very aware of. Um, it was uh, a part of U.S. culture in a way that it isn't today. Um, it was it was kind of omnipresent uh, in discussions of foreign policy uh, and in even in popular culture. And it was not a triumphant story, uh, even in the 1980s, even in the Reagan era. It was uh, something that everybody was very conscious was a mistake. And it was something that we had lost and lost miserably. Um, and this was this was everywhere. Um, I was I grew up on. Well, in the 80s, uh, I was uh, a kid on the Upper East Side. So it was kind of obviously kind of a sort of cloistered, um, uh, snooty uh, way to grow up. So maybe I had a different experience of things. But I mean, it really was everywhere. Vietnam was really everywhere in the culture. And the um, I think a good way of looking at that would be the Oscars. It seemed for, for, for a bit there, uh, almost every other year, there would either be a a prestige film about Vietnam that um, uh, that either won the Oscars or was nominated for the Oscars. So this was always something that was present in the culture. I was also thinking uh, recently of, there was a, a television show called Tour of Duty that I was, I think I, I was sort of, I would war with my parents a bit as a kid because I wanted to watch this. Um, this was a TV show, obviously long before the era of prestige TV, but it was, it was a well-regarded, um, uh, widely watched television show on Vietnam. And remember, this is in the 1980s. Uh, some people had cable. We didn't. Uh, most of the people in the United States had 12 channels or even fewer um, large networks to watch. And one of their three options on a given night was a really depressing uh, scripted drama television show on Vietnam. I mean, this was something that was everywhere. And it was, um, I've talked on the channel a bit about uh, comparing uh, the sort of sentence, the US Congress's treatment of Yemen today versus its treatment of um, the Reagan administration's attempts to get involved in Nicaragua. And uh, the US Congress did largely manage to shut that down. And I think a lot of the justifications they used for that were we really don't want another Vietnam. And uh, I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I think there was there was a real consciousness um, in the way that people looked at foreign policy issues and then uh, uh, back then of 
the way that escalation works, the way that um, getting involved in a country can be sort of a ladder, um, as we're definitely seeing in Syria today, as we definitely saw in Iraq. Um, people tend to look at Iraq as if, oh, you know, Bush just decided to do this. Well, it was actually the first Bush that decided to do this. And then there was this continued policy throughout Bush, Clinton, first Bush, Obama. And it, it, these things just keep escalating. We have escalating involvement unless we're, we're you know, pushed out. And this is, this is disastrous. There was a real consciousness of that back in the 1980s. Uh, I've heard it called the Vietnam War Syndrome or just the Vietnam Syndrome which may be a little reductive or unfair to the Vietnamese, but I think it was something worth holding on to, this consciousness that foreign policy can be dangerous, that it can, that it can whipsaw back at you. Um, and uh, I think that's, um, at the time of the first Gulf War in 1990, 1991, I always forget the exact year on that, uh, which is interesting because it's one of the first historical uh, things I fully experienced. I was 10, 10 11 years old back then. Um, at the time, it was touted by people in the Bush administration, by the sort of thinking classes as helping to wipe away the stain of Vietnam, um, which is kind of extraordinary because it didn't wipe away a thing. It basically just started the Vietnam process uh, in another country, uh, Iraq, which we're still still dealing with today. And if, and I, if I could actually, actually interject there, uh, I think I, I think I, I think I, that was pretty much my spiel. If you want to, well, uh, I can now hear how the youngins uh, deal with Vietnam. You know how they yeah. how we learn about Vietnam today. Well, just on the Iraq question, um, you know, some people might see your characterization of George Bush Senior uh, going into Kuwait uh, as starting the Vietnam process again as as somewhat unfair. Uh, because we had to go to Kuwait. Iraq invaded Kuwait. We were defending the rights of the sort of autocratic free world. Um, but anybody who's listened to my shows, for instance, knows that we'd already been involved in Iraq for a decade at that point, helping them to fight Iran in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, and it was our um, unintentional and tacit go-ahead that allowed or that gave Saddam Hussein the, uh, the ambit to invade Kuwait in the first place. So the first Gulf War wasn't the first act in this drama. It was already a decade or more in. Absolutely. Um, and also, I, I think what I think a lot of people, which once again, from my, 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 my great seniority, I'll point to uh, during the 90s, like being on a college campus, um, Iraq was not, uh, you know, uh, Iraq was already seen as a place that was occupied and destroyed by the U.S., military. Uh, we were operating, uh, I think there were no fly zones, there was a whole um, mess of stuff that we were doing, I and mean, we were regularly bombing Iraq, and uh, because of the sanctions regimes, the, the classic line on the um, campus uh, where, at the University of Michigan uh, back around the turn of the century was, you know, we, these sanctions were killing half a million Iraqi children a year. I don't know, I can't vouch for that at all, but this was an ongoing process. This this sort of thing with Iraq was something that just sort of just kept on rolling and rolling, which is why people who know anything about foreign policy were really, really leery of the, oh, well, with Assad, we just need to set up no-fly zones mm -hmm. like we did in Iraq, and it'll be fine, and then it'll just be up to, um, you know, maybe the next president or the president after that to just follow through on the logic of that and completely take out the Assad regime and have another multi-trillion dollar mm -hmm. um, albatross uh, around our necks. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get to this more later, but the other thing that's important about us having been involved in Iraq 10 years beforehand is, um, uh, I don't know how many uh, Trump fans we have in the audience, but at least they'll know this term, the deep state the idea that there's a, a more permanent state that exists within the bureaucracy versus the elected offices of the government. Um, Which I totally believe in, though. It's not exactly the way that... I just... No, it's real. It's just not necessarily sinister. Um, but what happens is you have, like we had in Iraq during the, the years of the Iraq War, uh, you have State Department guys who are on the ground. You've got guys in the CIA who are helping them to target Iranian forces. You've got all manner of expert bureaucrats who become involved with the regime in the country in question. Now, the presidents may change out, but those guys stay involved and they stay interested 
and they move up the rungs of the State Department of the CIA and they start recommending the next step, uh, the next step of involvement. Now that kind of turns around in Iraq because we end up making war on Iraq. But you look at stuff like Syria, we've got guys who are invested in the success of this, uh, the Kurdish forces, of the Syrian Democratic forces. Um, so once you dip a toe into the water, it's not just a toe. It's a toe that grows, I don't know, I don't know if the metaphor uh, really works out that way, but once you're in, you're in. Uh, and just to no fly zones is never just no fly zones. And just a brief note on the, uh, a lot of sort of my um, worldview uh, towards Syria, uh, actually my sort of form, my, helped to form my general worldview, but also uh, just the, the, my sense of the, 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 the tragedy of these, of these events is, uh, we focus a lot, a lot on the the lying, and I think we'll get to it, and the, the the mendacity of the people who were involved in Vietnam. Um, and I think at the top level, that's very true. Uh, but also, you know, at the lower level in Vietnam, I'm sure you had people who were exactly the same as they are in um, uh, Syria today. Well, of course, all the U.S. folks live in Istanbul, whereas they're incredibly invested in the struggles of uh, these these quite some, some some of which quite sympathetic rebels you know sort of Syrian rebels whereas I'm sure there were I mean you you saw that you can see the pictures of the boat people and whatnot there were hundreds of thousands millions of tremendously sympathetic um, people who were invested in the South Vietnamese regime mm -hmm. um, and and th that once you create those bureaucracies of people who are tremendously invested in a losing proposition, you have, you know, really good people who are tremendously dedicated to really bad ideas. Mm -hmm. um, it was fascinating. I, the the just a personal anecdote. I was in Istanbul and I had uh, um, there was a week. I don't know if anyone else would remember this, but there was a particular week during the. Oh, this was. This would have been back in 2016 or something like that. The Syrian war was going really badly for the rebels. And there was something like 50 State Department officials or something like that that wrote a letter to Obama saying, good Lord, like, this is our official protest. You must intervene in Syria. You must do more against Assad. To da, da, da. And it was, you know, it was sincere, what have you. And I ripped into this because it was, you know, I mean, as sincere as these people were, it's like they're basically... You know, advocating for another Iraq, um, and it's a terrible, terrible idea. And I just ripped into them on Facebook, and I was actually I'd, I'd organized a party that weekend, and like one of the guys uh, who had written that document, who had signed that, sort of showed up at the party, and it was it was like it was very hard for me because I knew this person to be an incredibly dedicated um, person in terms of humanitarian relief and this, that, and the other thing. But because we had set up this situation. Um, he was deeply invested and deeply and 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 seriously interested in advocating on the behalf of uh, people who are leading the United States in a disaster and their own country in a disaster, frankly. But anyway, that's we don't need to go too yeah. far into that. And uh, it's something that I'd I'd bet any amount of money on that we'll we'll see develop uh, if we do get involved in Syria. But one of the interesting dynamics uh, that took place in Vietnam is that you had bureaucracies that were action-oriented. So the MACV, the Military Advisory Command Vietnam, which was the military, and then the operations side of the CIA, those were the guys who continually produced bad intelligence and set it up top. Optimistic bad intelligence. But um, through the whole conflict, from the 1950s through uh, to the end of the 1970s, the intelligence side of the CIA continually produced honest, pessimistic reports of the situation in the country. Um, because they didn't need to push more funding for their agenda, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a different situation from the State Department guys you're talking about, which is coming from a more humanitarian place. But anyway, um, so getting back to the uh, <laughs> what we were talking about quite a long time ago, mm. um, my, well, just first, just to back up what Rob was saying, uh, The Deer Hunter came out in 1978, Apocalypse Now came out in 1979, Born in the USA was 84, Platoon was 86, MASH ran from 72 to 83. That's about the Korean War, but really it's about Vietnam. It's really about Vietnam, yeah. Uh, Good Night Saigon, which is Billy Joel's song, came out in 82. Hamburger Hill, which is a god-awful movie, came out in 87. 
Um, and then recently, just the target has faded out into my own youth, uh, in the 2000s, we have pretty much got We Were Soldiers uh, in 2002, uh, which was a pre-9-11 film, because uh, they shot it before 9-11, and then uh, Tropic Thunder, which came out in 2008. Yeah. Which, uh, we can't really get into this episode, but I defend to the death. That's actually a pretty incisive Vietnam War movie. Mm. Um, but me, growing up, uh, what I got in U.S. history, and this is this is something that our uh, our third Ernie backed up, was uh, for whatever reason in Michigan, I took U.S. history. I think every year of grade school, uh, and then every year of high school, I got some form of it. Um, and except for those, sorry, two years in high school. Except for those two years in high school, it was just retelling the revolution over and over and over again. Just the revolution maybe from colonies to revolution to 1812, 10 times. Uh, it wasn't so much history as hagiography. Hey, mm -hmm. You know, this, this was a, almost a legendary uh, positive event that happened in the history of the world. Well, um, I still believe that, but... Uh, which, which, well, I don't know. No, I'm not really on, the, on board with that. But that's, that's standard state-based education. It's, it's a propaganda regime aimed at its own youth. That's kind of the point. Um, but only once in uh, in all of those years did I ever get anything on Vietnam, and only because I had Karen Lessonberry, who was uh, voted like 10 years in a row the best history teacher in the state of Michigan. Uh, and it was still, even then, only about two weeks. Um, so you talk about the difference between maybe your upbringing and mine. I got nothing, man. I got nothing in Vietnam. And the only reason it ended up fascinating me was because for whatever reason, I ended up fascinated with all of those Vietnam War movies I just, I just uh, rattled off. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention here, because uh, it's my upbringing is no longer really applicable because I now I'm now I'm incredibly well versed in this. But uh, I was just talking to Rob about that Vietnam is going to be the end of safer democracy uh, in all likelihood. I'm going to law school in August, and that's pretty much going to be the end of the, the end of the thing. Rob, uh, very disappointed in that choice. Um, but the reason it was going to be the finale, you know, after I did Nicaragua and after I did Honduras and after I did uh, Argentina and Chile and the School of the Americas and Indonesia and assassinating Lumumba in Congo, after everything else, Vietnam was going to be the cap off. It was going to be the finale because Vietnam encapsulates everything for me uh, from stuff like failures to learn from history. That is that the French fought a better war than we did uh, and we refused to learn from them because they were French. Um, to stuff, I mean, crazy esoterica, like uh, Rob just mentioned the environmental destruction that went on in Vietnam because of things like Agent Orange. Well, Monsanto, the seed company that now owns like 90% of all GMO seeds and produces something like 85% of all seeds uh, for industrial agriculture in the world, Monsanto got its start producing Agent Orange for the U.S. government. <laughs> you know, before that, they were, you know, they're some rinky-dink little company. Um, so Vietnam encapsulates everything. Uh, which is why I'm interested in it and why in this show I wanted to talk about what it means for the U.S. and why it is that we're still talking about it, at least I'm still talking about it nowadays. So that's why I want to do the show. All right. Uh, so what first up on your agenda is... Uh... Lying in politics. Lying in politics. So uh, Lying in Politics is the title of an essay by Hannah Arendt. It's part of her Crises in the Republic um, and she focuses on Vietnam, but I see the Vietnam War, at least our involvement in Vietnam, is really the beginning of a trend in U.S. politics of lying to the people, especially with regard to foreign policy, um, not as an exception, but as a rule. So there's this interesting dynamic uh, that happens after the end of the Second World War, which is that the Republican Party has been out of power for decades. Uh, all of FDR and then Truman. Out of power for decades. Yeah, this is weird. I think they've lost the video. Uh, no way. Is mine off? Interesting. Mine's still on. How are you guys getting audio? Huh. Well, this is no good. No, this is no good. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything here. Huh. Yeah. This, this is a new problem. Yeah, new problem. All right, now I'm seeing us. Okay, good. We're back. Oh, good. Okay. Well, sorry. Well, sorry about that. Uh, I still don't have video, but it seems like it's working for some people. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Go on. Do 
Anyway, so the end of the Second World War, the Republican Party has been out of power for decades, and they're looking around for an issue to seize on that will allow them to force the Democrats out of power. So what happens during Truman's term is that we lose, we lose China. Uh, that's a long story to go into, but because of Henry Luce at Time Magazine and a whole lot of other stuff, we, the American people, felt for some reason that we kind of owned China, that China was ours under Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists. Mm -hmm. What happens is Chiang Kai-shek, because he's a terrible leader, is defeated by Mao Zedong. Uh, he flees to Taiwan and uh, China falls. We lose China. So what the Republicans do is they make this a wedge issue. They say that the Democrats collaborated with the communists in China to lose it. And their evidence for this is that a lot of the old China hands, a lot of the State Department people, were sort of pro-communist. Not because they liked communism, but because they thought Chiang Kai-shek, as he was and his regime was, uh, totally corrupt and totally ineffective. Uh, and then we should have stopped supporting him and made friends with the communists. So this is going to be a long story. But what happens is that they end up making this a wedge issue. They ruin the careers of all these guys in the State Department. Uh, they sort of spark off Joe McCarthy's uh, red-baiting run in the Senate. Uh, and what happens is that the Democratic Party decides that it's not going to continue to try to explain things to the American people because they try to explain the fall of China. They release this incredibly thorough document. Nobody reads it. Everybody thinks the Democrats are basically communists. Uh, and from that point on, neither party tells the full story of any foreign policy decision to the American people because they think that the American people are too dumb. They might be right, but too dumb to understand what they're selling. So... The way this plays into Vietnam is uh, especially uh, on the campaign trail with JFK, JFK sells the idea that the Republicans are soft on communism, right? Because they're not helping out the South Vietnamese regime enough. Mm -hmm. And in order to sell that idea, JFK has to continue saying that South Vietnam is absolutely crucial to the world fight against communism, even though he knows it's not. It's a little known fact that uh, everybody in government who ever sold the idea of the domino theory to the, pub to the public never actually believed in the domino theory in private. It was always just a reasoning to sell to the public because they thought the public wasn't smart enough to understand what was going on. So what ends up happening is that the Democrats sell over and over and over again the idea that Vietnam is essential. Uh, and that claim after JFK gets elected he has to continue saying it's essential to the Congress that the Congress will give him the money to support the regime that he said needs to be supported, even though he knows it doesn't. Uh, and that dynamic plays through the whole war in Vietnam. We continue escalating for reasons that were made up, and we continue to use those reasons because we said them so many times in public that we couldn't go back on. And it's interesting how invested many people still are uh, in those approaches. Uh, you know, you can... You know, from the National Review to Prager University, you can find people who are still like, we could have won in Vietnam, you know, just sort of leaving behind entirely the, the question, was there any point to winning in Vietnam? Was there any point at all other than trying to uh, stifle and strangle uh, something that didn't deserve to be strangled? Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting that my my uh, uh, my father, who typically described is is somewhat to the right of Attila the Hun, uh, his take on Vietnam is that yeah, it was Truman. Truman fucked it up. Uh, if if we had just you know, Ho Chi Minh was a great partner against the Japanese. Uh, if we'd just uh, just gone with him instead of uh, letting the French um, uh, do their thing, um, you know, probably never would have happened. And I actually do, you know, I'm I'm probably more um, more of a fan of the Cold War uh, than you are, John. Or I actually believe in some of the justifications, whereas I, I doubt that you do. Um, I do feel that worldwide communism was a real threat, and uh, I, you know, I've I've gone back and forth with that. I do wonder if, like, even with all the the lying, even with all the waste and destruction, um, was the Vietnam War, you know, sort of useful in tying down all those resources from the communists or, or something like that. That was sort of something that I, I wondered about. But then you, you just look at the aftermath and it, it's uh, it's within four years of the end of South Vietnam that China and Vietnam are getting into a war. Uh, this, mm -hmm. this whole, I, I do believe that at, at periods in uh, the early 20th century, end of the 40s and 50s, worldwide communism when it was fresh, when it was new, and 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 rampaging was a real threat. But by the by the sixties and seventies, I, I think everybody was realizing. And if you look, you know, it's been a long or time. Should have been realizing, huh? 
What's that? Or should have been realizing. Well, just just the 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 primacy of national interest. You know, just how important. And if you look at all of the, it's been about two decades since I've done this. But if you look at the history of the Soviet Union and how they had to deal with stuff, um, and just how important nationality and nationalism always was from them for them from the beginning. Um, uh, if anybody in the Pentagon was actually thinking. They should have realized, wait a second, like the Vietnamese are about as interested in working with the Chinese as the Chinese are with Russia. You know, these mm -hmm. people border each other and freaking hate each other. And uh, there was really no reason, no reason at all for yeah. us to be just a complete wasted own goal. And also the, the uh, while I'm sure there was significant Chinese and Russian support for the Vietnamese, I, I think the, the the relevant analogy today is uh, the Iranian support for the Houthis, excuse me, <coughs> in that, um, Salad. thank you, uh, in that uh, for, uh, I spent a lot of time poo-pooing uh, Iranian involvement in Yemen, because, uh, you know, if you look at a map, and, you know, Saudi Arabia's there, and they've got a blockade, and this, that, and the other thing, uh, but there is a, a, a non-zero amount of money and expertise that Iran is is you know pumping into Yemen to to stick it to the to the Saudis, but it is it is it is negligible. It is tiny. It is it is very very easy uh, for uh, the Iranians to get and you know incredible multiples of their effort uh, because they've got really dedicated people on the ground who want to fight um, uh, the who want to fight the Saudis who are putting their people on the ground and that's. Mm -hmm. You know, very similar to Vietnam, in that the Chinese and the Russians could, you know, funnel, you know, some arms or something like that. You know, a, a tiny amount to have this incredibly outsized effect, because the United States insisted on being there on the ground. Um, yeah, and, and uh, so yeah, so even that, even that justification that I used to think, looking at Yemen, I'm like, oh no, wait, no, we're just we were just the Saudis in Vietnam. That didn't mm -hmm. actually provide any benefit at all. Yeah, uh, which is uh, which is. Really sad because it just it just impacts again. Just like the you know, obviously the million millions of Vietnamese and Cambodians, but also you know just those fifty thousand um, fifty thousand American soldiers, the trillion dollars. I mean, it's sort of the the complete derailing of the Great Society. You know, all of the money that could have gone towards something a little more worthwhile. Yeah, didn't. and there's a, there's a few points there. Um, First is that, uh, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of the Second World War, um, if you're worried about communism, about any country going communist, well, then, you, I guess, yeah, you had to get involved in Vietnam. But if you're worried about the calm in turn, about the third communist international, about communist parties being run from Moscow, mm -hmm. well, then you really only ever had to be worried about Eastern Europe, where there were real concerns, you know, the Prague Spring and the invasion of Hungary and all that stuff. That that was bad. That was democratic societies getting destroyed uh, and, and becoming part of the Warsaw Pact. That's that's no good. But um, it was obvious to some people, to some observers, even in 1946 and 47, uh, that national interests, that nationalism was always going to be a stronger force than communism. And uh, yeah, we started to wake up to that in general in the 60s and 70s. But George Kennan, uh, from the long telegram on, was selling that story immediately. He was saying, we don't have to worry about the fall of China. The Chinese hate the Russians. The Russians hate the Chinese. Neither of them are going to listen to the other. Um, and for that very reason, Truman and Dean Acheson and the rest of those guys pushed Kennan out of the State Department. Uh, because the long telegram for them was useful because it outlined the strategy of containment. But everything else he was saying did not square with their view of the post-war world. Post-war post -war world, there we go. Um, and then the other thing is uh, there's this excellent quote uh, from Ho Chi Minh uh, in, the 19, in about 1945 when he started to no negotiate with the French uh, who were coming back into Vietnam and offering to the French um, sort of a protectorate, you know, becoming sort of a Canada. Uh, rather than full independence. Uh, and there were people in his Communist Party and in, in, in the Viet Minh um, who were advocating the idea of partnering with the, with the uh, Chinese. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the war, the Chinese occupied half the country and the British occupied the other half, and oh. both of them let the French in. Um, and Ho Chi Minh said, I would rather smell French shit for a decade than sniff Chinese shit for a millennium. 
<laughs> because as any Vietnamese knows, the Chinese dominated that country for a uh, thousand years and more. So um, the Vietnamese were never going to be good partners of the Chinese. Yeah. Uh, and the only reason the Chinese were giving them aid in the first place is that they wanted to tie down American resources. Uh, but then Nixon made nice with the Chinese and the Chinese started building up their war effort to uh, take Vietnam back, uh, which, didn't, which worked out about as hot for them as it did for us. So. <laughs> Really, I, I, the, the, the interpretations I'd read of that was that uh, the whole point of that Chinese invasion was just to sort of make a point, break some shit and get out. Were they actually attempting to take? Uh, to well, take I mean, the point is get in, break some shit and get out unless it goes pretty well. And then it's maybe hang out for a little while. True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So we got lying in politics. The end of this section that I thought was interesting is, um, well, so the lying in politics thing begins uh, because the Democrats don't think that they can convince the American people of a nuanced argument. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, exactly the argument that Kennan was making. They thought Americans couldn't wrap their minds around the idea that communism was bad uh, and then shift to maybe communism is not that bad as long as there's a strong nationalist element. Mm -hmm. um, so they just stuck with communism is bad, right? Mm -hmm. But this morphs. Uh, over the over the decades to LBJ basically just saying I'm just gonna lie to the American people because I care more about the great society than I do about them knowing that I'm shipping ten thousands of men to Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, and then to Nixon where it's just I'm gonna say I'm gonna end the war and then I'm not yeah. and yeah. that's it um, and the ultimate permutation is you get to the Iraq war and it's like you know, our motives here are confused. Maybe I have some sort of daddy complex. Maybe I just want to get my Halliburton friends rich. But there's no greater story that they want to sell to the United States people. And there's no other program, like the Great Society under LBJ, that they want to get done. So they're going to lie about the war to get that done. It's just like, just lying for the sake of lying, I guess. Uh, uh, it, it's interesting. You, you mentioned that sort of Vietnam thing. Uh, that There was one lesson uh, that the that the U.S. government and the sort of broader bureaucracy learned. Um, and it's interesting looking back at that Vietnam protest era. And uh, I think the draft ended before the end of the Vietnam War. Is that correct? I'm not 100% sure. Like I said, I'm only up to 1946. But, uh, but, but, the, um, but the drawdown in troops happened significantly before 1975. Yeah, draft, draft ends January 27th, 73. Uh, and troop drawdown started in Nixon's first term, I believe. Exactly. So what 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 the U.S. national security bureaucracy learned and learned very well uh, was that if you've got a volunteer army, um, and also it's not just the fact that we have a volunteer army now, it's also uh, the fact that our sort of way of fighting war has become much more technical and much more removed. Uh, we're involved in dozens of countries now. And we've got sort of small special forces, uh, you know, the, the sort of mass um, movements of people, not even on a World War II scale, but even on the, the, I just watched We Were Soldiers last night, just the idea of putting hundreds of folks in to take some territory. That like, that approach to war is, is over. That's not something that we do anymore. And the national security bureaucracy, I think, was taught by Nixon that as long as the American people don't have real skin in the game, as long as they don't have um people u.s boys dying nobody gives a shit you know and and i'm not to say that there weren't um uh u.s soldiers dying in in vietnam sorry in iraq and afghanistan uh there absolutely have been and it's it's a tragedy but if you look at the actual numbers even at the height even at the worst days in 2006 2007 i mean this is a is a, is a tiny uh tiny amount of people compared uh to vietnam or korea or world war ii and compared uh, to the casualties on the other side and among the civilian population. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's and that that's pretty fundamentally, perhaps even illustrated by uh, this uh, this program. Uh, Americans just don't care about uh, just don't care. And and v, and yet yeah, Nixon, Nixon dramatically accelerated the civilian death, uh, expanded the war to both Cambodia and Laos. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Um, to expand the war to neighboring countries, you know, dramatically stepped up, you know, millions of pounds of bombs being dropped. Um, and uh, the American people were like, yeah, well, Johnny's not getting drafted to die so much anymore. So the kind of whole protest movement just kind of petered out. 
this is actually this is another uh, well I don't know if it's a lesson we learned but it's certainly a lesson from the Vietnam War that uh, Vietnam we tried it in Korea we realized very quickly at least for the military guys on the ground that it wasn't working out and we kind of cut it out but Vietnam was the first time I think that we tried to fight a fully technical war a fully technological war uh, you know we didn't want to commit anything like the number of troops it would have taken to secure areas uh, and to actually I don't know, liberate, whatever. What we tried to do was use our machine prowess, our industrial prowess to win a war. So we ended up doing stuff like the bombing under Nixon, which was uh, almost entirely indiscriminate uh, because as long as you flew the B-52s really, really high, nobody could shoot them down. So just drop the bombs from up there, right? Nobody's in danger. Um, but even in the early years of the war, uh, even before we committed troops, we'd started use, uh, working with the, sorry, the Vietnamese military. Um, to set up free fire zones. So between our supposedly safe villages, we just blow away trails and villages and whatever else. And as long as Americans weren't dying, that was what we were gonna do. And the natural outgrowth of that strategy right now is indiscriminate drone strikes. Don't even declare war. Uh, not that we declared war in Vietnam either, but don't even don't even mention that we have a war going on in the United States people. You know, just blow people away with drones. And that that's the the, the sort of failure of that. Uh, approach is always interesting, but it, it, it does actually succeed in uh, in its goal of uh, less American, fewer, sorry, fewer American casualties. Uh, the uh, I was just reading in this book, uh, um, Shadows of the American Century by uh, Andrew, no, Alfred W. McCoy. Uh, it's a really, fun, really interesting sort of collection of stuff, but he talks about the first like fully electronic battleground and how there were certain, there were elements, I think perhaps that was exactly what we were just talking about. There were certain elements of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that even before uh, uh, sort of, you know, the user interfaces we know were supposedly sort of automatically and, and uh, uh, guarded by computers and sensors and this, that, and the other thing. It was a complete failure. Yeah. Um, and and uh, also I think of, uh, of course, Rumsfeld famously thought he could take and hold Iraq um, with uh, a fraction of as many soldiers as were used to kick, to kick, or a fraction or a smaller number of soldiers than were used just to kick Saddam Hussein out of Iraq. And while that amount of soldiers could very effectively, you know, take and destroy Iraq, it was completely incapable of actually garrisoning uh, the country. And it was by only by piling in soldiers that we got to like something that you could almost call success, and it's it's sort of fascinating these these ways that uh, these 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 clever ideas that rarely work, but mm -hmm. they do accomplish that goal of fewer American casualties. Yeah. Um, and if you can if you can insulate um, war from actual costs and casualties, they've demonstrated that they can have a blank check from the American people. Yeah. The, the other interesting thing there, too, is that a lot of the guys at the end of the Vietnam War felt that the public relations battle is what, them caused, what caused them to lose the war. They had this idea that right at the end, we were really just a couple months from winning, which was, which was as true in 73 as it was in 65, which is to say it was never true. Um, but the idea of shielding the American people from the realities of war was to win the war, mm -hmm. uh, whereas nowadays... At, at shielding the reality from the American people so that the war can go on, but really with no definite endpoint for any of our conflicts. Nope. It's just to allow it to continue. Nope. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you, you get to this later, but should, can we just talk about that that sort of ladder of escalation? Sure. Um, is this now a good, good time to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. It's just, um, and I think this is something that that when you or I read the news and we see something like, oh, there's a whole, just, just, just a bunch of US soldiers acting as advisors on the ground uh, in Africa. Um, uh, that sets off these incredible red flags for us uh, because that's, that's, uh, that's how Vietnam started. Um, that's uh, in a very different sense, like different bureaucracies, that's actually how I see this conflict in Syria starting. And yes, Iraq was a very different approach in that we sort of switched completely. But if you look at the way our interactions in Iraq have gone with uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, for example, you have 
just this this ladder of acceleration that that we really love in the United States to associate these terrible wars with individual people. Vietnam, to a high degree, is still Johnson's war or Nixon's war. It, it's it's and we don't look at the bureaucracy. We don't look at the incentives of the the sort of uh, you know Sean Hannity would call it the deep state. Uh, ben Rhodes, uh, Obama's um, I don't know speechwriter slash advisor or whatnot called it the blob. We 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 really want it to be about a president. We want Iraq to be about Bush's mistake, but it's not. It's it's there's different approaches in Republican and Democratic administrations. Uh, you know, in a Democratic administration, it's more about oh, the responsibility to protect. And look, we're just doing we're just doing what's right um, by funneling billions of dollars to uh, jihadist uh, rebels uh, in Syria uh, versus, you know, the more muscular uh, Bush or uh, I don't even know how to characterize what Trump is doing. Um, but yeah, but it's 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 all in the same direction. It's a ladder of escalation. And when you hear something like "Ooh, advisors," you should be terrified because that's. I mean, I think I'd, I, you'd be able to speak to this better. But I think the the our soldiers in Vietnam were known as advisors up until two years before they were taken out of there, right, or something like that. No, 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 no. Uh, advisors up to sixty five. Um, I mean, there were, there were always advisors on the ground, but the idea is up until sixty five. We weren't allowed uh, to engage the Viet Cong or the NVA uh, in combat. We were just embedded with the South Vietnamese Army, the ARVN, uh, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Um, of course, by 1965, we had tens of thousands of advisors on the ground, and they'd fired shots in anger for years by that point. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and it was like, and the first U.S. soldiers were dying in the what the fifties or the early sixties. Uh, the first American soldier to die in Vietnam dies in I think forty six. Forty six. Yeah, the uh, Viet Minh they accidentally shoot him because they thought he was a Frenchman. Ah, riding in an open top jeep. And uh, was it you who was making the point that? Oh, no, actually, I think it was this book that was uh, the French effort in Vietnam was largely U.S. supported. Uh, and after like 51 or so, yeah. By the end of the war, we were paying for something like 85% of all their, uh, of their entire war effort. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just the whole Vietnam experience, which I hope we're, we're expressing well, is, is really worth delving into because it, it just it provides the model of something that we've set up a horrifying number of franchises with. Now. Uh, we're talking about uh, advisors, and it's, it is something that I can't find a book on this. I can barely find an article on this. Uh, you folks who follow the news might have been might have heard that four, I think it was last fall at some point, four U.S. special soldiers, special forces uh, uh, soldiers were killed in Niger, not Nigeria, in Niger. I mean, this is a country that uh, U.S. senators you know, couldn't find on a map and didn't know we had soldiers in. And we now have, I think AFRICOM, the Africa Command was set up in 2008 or so. And we now have soldiers in, I don't know, half the countries of Africa. And they're all acting in this very amorphous advisor capacity. Um, so every single one of those, um, I'm actually a little bit optimistic on the Middle East. I think that much like Latin America in the 80s, we may sort of move on from the nightmare in the Middle East um, in the next decade or so. I mean, things, you know, you could almost, I mean, gosh, Iraq is almost looking positive today, which is pretty extraordinary. I mean, this is very hopeful. I'm a natural optimist. But it's not like this dynamic will go away. We will just move on somewhere else. And we're mm -hmm. already setting up these, these ladders of escalation in literally dozens of African countries. Um, what's kind of crazy is that and I had believed the 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 approach that okay, you know, we're we're just training and advising because that's a big part of the military industrial complex. You know, you can't just sell, um, uh, you can't just sell a, a, a million dollar battle tank uh, to Niger. You know, you need to have folks, and it's usually U.S. forces, you know, doing the sales work and training folks. You know, so that was sort of how I'd seen this advisor thing, which is very consciously the way that it's pitched. Mm -hmm. Yet in Niger, we had four of these special forces advisors in a pitched battle uh, with um, hundreds of militants 
and I mean, we just have no idea what's going on. Um, yeah. in, you and, know, in 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 Nigeria and other countries, you also have these you know pretty debatably um, worthwhile folks that were. I mean, even you know, even John and I have no idea about the the details of you know the Niger strongman's thing. So it's very easy. And now that these sort of the bond has been loose between the boundaries getting you know shaker and shaker between advisor and you know okay, you're just going to lead our forces in battle. So like, what you know, was it ISIS in Niger or was it folks who just don't agree with the strongman who mm -hmm. the strongman has chosen to portray as ISIS people. It's incredibly, uh, you know, the, it, it's, it's a very slippery slope and yeah. we're on it in 30, 30 odd countries. Um, and the thing that doesn't, no, the thing that doesn't worry me as much is stuff like Niger, um, because there are guys, me. because there are guys in the Pentagon, uh, and to a lesser extent guys in the uh, state department who want to, who want to move pieces around in the global chessboard, you know, who are fascinated with the idea that, well, we put a couple of guys here, we put a couple of guys here, we have this regime, we have that regime, we can pit them against one another. Um, none of that worries me in a geopolitical sense. It worries me in the sense that we're helping to murder more people than may have been murdered otherwise. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, but what worries me is when we know about it. Now, you'd think that's counterintuitive, right? I should know. Yeah. We don't know about it. But um, the problem is, uh, well, take for example, Vietnam, right? The reason Vietnam escalates is because the U.S. government continues to sell the South Vietnamese regime to the U.S. people, right? So people in the U.S. become invested in the idea that there are these democratic Vietnamese people who need our help. Mm -hmm. Um, and it becomes more and more difficult for, to, uh, for us to de-escalate what's going on or get out entirely. So we end up escalating because we only really know one way to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that I think about this is that you have old style imperialism, you know, British imperialism. Mm -hmm. So when the British support, say the British were supporting ZM uh, in Vietnam, the mm -hmm. British don't have to pretend that he's a Democrat. They don't have to pretend that he's a good guy. He's just their guy. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that we always hear Nixon and LBJ in the private White House conversations saying he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but they can't sell that to the public. The American public doesn't accept the idea that he's our guy and he's a bastard, but he's at least our guy. Mm -hmm. The American people, anyone we're supporting, has to be a Democrat, has to be a hero, has to be the champion of their people. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I disagree with that. Actually. But what I'm, but no, no, no. But think, think about this. Obama wants to support the Syrian Democratic forces. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not. They're not a ragtag. I mean, they're not a bunch of different groups of jihadists who are just barely on our side versus their side. They're not a bunch of unreliable people. They're not a bunch of guys in the desert. They're Democrats. They're the Syrian Democratic forces. They deserve our American help. Mm -hmm. I'm saying the idea is we can only ever sell these conflicts as fights of democracy against something else, whether it's communism or terrorism or dictators or whatever. So the moment one of these uh, engagements with U.S. Special Forces or advisors rises to the level of public attention, mm -hmm. it suddenly becomes much harder to get those guys out, and it becomes much easier to put more guys on the ground. You see what I'm saying? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I'd say I probably disagree with that. I think that, uh, yeah, I'd say I disagree with that, because I just think about all those places, all those Cold War regimes where we're supporting legitimate animals. Um, and it was only, um, you know, from Indonesia to the Philippines to all of Latin America. And it, uh, it uh, I mean, I think we're, we might be confusing two questions, just sort of the troops on the ground. And it, it's, it's whenever sunlight was, was rigorously placed on those guys, you know, actually usually after uh, the Cold War, uh, they, they were allowed to fall. Um, and I think it's when we're, I think it's when it's hidden, when it's it's um, uh, when it's a question of attention, and you know the U.S. public individuals just aren't paying any attention. That I think more uh, more damaging things can happen. And while um, obviously an, an incredible amount, uh, I think this is something we try to get to. Is like while an incredible amount of attention is, and both of us uh, do this, is placed on you know, Vietnam and Cambodia in the 70s or the Middle East today. Um, it's also worth paying attention to what's happening in all of the other countries. Um, and I think that, 
there's a lot of shady stuff that obviously in terms of dictator support uh, was happening uh, during the Cold War and is also now happening, you know, I call it dictator support. Who knows? Nobody really knows. Nobody's even written a freaking book on the U.S. military in um, in Africa since 2008 or and there aren't there isn't that much coverage. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't I don't think I quite follow what you're trying to well, say. Take, take this, for example. Why is it nowadays that we have so much trouble abandoning Saudi Arabia, even though that relationship's not really doing anything for us anymore? Because a very conscious public relations effort that hides the ball. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. What what happened on on behalf of the South Vietnamese South Vietnamese regime was a very conscious public relations effort on the on yeah. the part of the South Vietnamese and on the part of the U.S. government. Yeah. Uh, why were we able to send millions and billions of dollars to genocidal regimes in Guatemala? Well, because the U.S. government very consciously created great press for every new dictator as they arrived. Why is it that we think that the Saudis are doing good stuff in Yemen versus the Iranians? Because we but, have but a I, I, regime I, working on behalf of the Saudis. Just from my own work, I, I think that it's anybody who becomes actually aware of Saudi Arabia and what it is, hates it and wants to wants well, that's, to fight against it. Exactly, exactly. And anybody who went to South Vietnam and actually palled around for a little while found out that the South Vietnamese regime was rotten. But that doesn't speak to the great majority of people here in the United States who've been lapping up propaganda for the, you know their entire lives. But I think correcting that propaganda is a worthwhile effort. Yeah, no, no. I, I'm, I'm saying not that we shouldn't talk about advisors in other countries. I'm saying I get worried when the U.S. government starts talking about advisors in other countries because that, to me, reads as a lead up to an escalation. Okay. All right. Man. Yeah, not when Mother Jones publishes something about four guys dying in Niger, but when Donald Trump gets up uh, during the State of the Union and talks about how they were heroes and we need to commit to the same struggle or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Cool. Shall we move on? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, actually, there was one other thing I wanted to ask you about here, because uh, I'm, not, I'm not particularly well-versed, but uh, just because of my liberal inclinations, and especially uh, an already rosy view of the Obama administration that's starting to develop in my head, uh, I think pretty much purely as contrast to what's going on right now. Mm. Um, in terms of selling an idea that's not the real idea to the U.S. people uh, in order to facilitate a conflict, uh, what do you think about Obama? About what little he did in Syria, about what he did in uh, uh Libya, kill me. Um, well, I, I think Libya was, yeah, kill me is the appropriate uh, response there. The, uh, I think the way that I look at Obama is the more that I look at his Iran deal effort, mm -hmm. the more heroic I find that particular thing. I think that is extraordinary. Um, and I think that people should actually recognize, um, I mean, it, it's, it's now likely to fail um, but that was an extraordinary individual effort because if you look into the sort of the, the, the background of that, you like maybe had a couple people who saw things the same way that he put in place, but the instincts of his entire political party, Washington, D.C., were like, no, don't do this. Don't do this. We, we need Iran as this bad guy. So that, um, like I said, the more I look at it, uh, I was always an Obama critic. The more I look at it, the more impressed I am with that particular move, because that is honestly the only thing I can point to. Actually, Trump's uh, end of the CIA funding of uh, Syrian rebels is very impressive. Um, but obviously now he's about to take down Assad himself. Well, anyway, we'll get into that towards the end. Um, but... Uh, but you know, the, uh, uh, in terms of a sustained effort by a president to um, sustained incredibly complex, uh, with a lot of moving pieces, effort by a sitting president to shut down an element of the military industrial complex, I can't, I can't think of anything between that and Eisenhower's um, uh, speech leaving you know, what's the, you know, his, uh, his fi Eisenhower's final address where he popularized yeah. the concept of military industrial complex. I can't think of anything between Eisenhower and Obama's effort against the military industrial complex that was that, uh, that, that, that nothing, there's nothing from president in between. So that is heroic. That is impressive as hell.
And unfortunately, I, I mean, if I'm wrong here, but something that was sold on its merits. Yeah. That is, yeah. This, this is what it is. There was, there was no, as far as I know, no lying involved. No, I mean, Fox News would tell you different, but no, it's an extraordinary, amazing effort. That said, um, because he's a U.S. president, and I need to do a video. I mean, U.S. presidents are not that powerful. That's which makes what Obama did with Iran so much more impressive. In order to do that, he had to sign on to a whole range of horseshit. Uh, Yemen is a fucking nightmare. I talk about it a lot, and that's a hell of a lot more on Obama than it is on Trump. I mean, yeah, you can talk about like details of this, that, and the other fucking thing, but it's Obama and his administration that committed us to the horror show in Yemen. It's Obama and his administration looking at it from what little I've looked at the planning and like rolling up to it. I think Obama was probably digging in his heels and keeping it from happening. But who fucking cares? Syria is still on him. Um, mm -hmm. That That is that nightmare. Um, I've done a couple of videos on the channel, like talking about how, you know, we have this the way that it's pitched to us in the US like, oh, it was the Russians who made everything terrible. Well, no, actually, if you look at like refugee flows and casualty numbers, when the Russians got involved in 2015, I believe it was the fall of 2015, these numbers did double. Um, but if you go back two years from what's now been acknowledged and come out in the New York Times that the United States put a billion dollars, this is the largest CIA program ever, I believe. And that's not just in terms of inflation. When you look at CIA programs, it's people doing skullduggery stuff and you know, $100 million there, $10 million there, even at the height of the Cold War. The CIA itself put a billion dollars in to funding Syrian rebels against Assad and coordinated billions more from the Gulfy countries, all right? We created the war in Syria. Yes, in 2015, when the Russians got in, um, the, there was a doubling in casualties and refugee flows. In 2013, which is sort of, we were definitely involved before, but you know, for as far as like rigorously documented New York Times articles talking about CIA programs, from mid 2013, we started this multi-billion dollar program of arming rebels and whatnot, from that point on, casualty and refugee flows from Syria, as unreliable as they, those are, we do know that they went up by a factor of 10. Okay? So, like, this horrible, horrible Russia involvement did double casualties and now seems to be ending the war, unless Trump does his thing. The U.S. intervention put, you know, basically meant that 10 times more people died in Syria. So, yeah, um, there's that. Uh, that's on Obama. There's Libya that's on Obama. Once again, you know, Obama. And once again, he is a hero with the Iran deal, but you know, he got, he did that. Um, he destroyed. And this sort of myth that he was leading from behind, I, okay, I don't want to go into that. But um, uh, I, anyway, um, I know a few things, but uh, about the Libya thing, like it was U.S. folks who did you know, the, 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 uh, the French and the British, you know, were supposedly leading that. Uh, no, like they got to go in and bomb things after the U.S. planes and forces mm -hmm. destroyed the anti-aircraft stuff the night before. I mean, that was that was once again completely um, a U.S. project. Um, yeah. And that happened under Obama. And and, uh, and it's also that in particular really freaking gets to me because. I think a lot of the critiques, there are valid critiques of Russia and China. Sorry, am I going off too much here? There I, are I've got something just when you're done. Yeah, there are valid critiques of Russia and China and that, well, why are Russia and China always trying to block stuff in the Security Council when it comes to humanitarian stuff? Well, in Libya, they didn't. In Libya, mostly because Gaddafi was such a universally loathed figure. But in Libya, they're like, you know what? Okay, we're going to let you do this. NATO, we're going to let you do this to show us what and what a humanitarian intervention is going to be like. Don't don't overthrow him. Don't overthrow him. Whatever you do, don't overthrow him. But you can save Benghazi. Save Benghazi. Do this humanitarian thing you've been talking about for so long. Save Benghazi. Um, and uh, we did that. And then we rolled across the country. And then uh, Gaddafi ended up, uh, you know, murdered by a gang of people on the street and it was videotaped and sent everywhere. So if you wonder why Russia and China 
um, refused to participate in any Security Council UN stuff um, on, uh, you know, on humanitarian issues. That's why. They tried it in Libya and we fucked them. That's on Obama. Uh, there's also in Yemen, there's the murder of uh, almost an entire family of American citizens. Uh, yes, Anwar al-Awlaki is a bad dude. Um, but uh, the idea that he can be murdered without due process is a horrific precedent that will be used uh, by presidents to come. Uh, also, um, not as up on this as it should be, but my understanding is that his teenage son was also murdered in a separate strike, yeah. and possibly his daughter as well. Now, I haven't I haven't followed up on that in de detail, but yeah, that's that's all Obama too. Um, so, no, I'm not a fan of uh, Obama's general foreign policy legacy. I do think he tried to do one heroic thing, and this isn't like a you know an anti-Obama thing. This is what a U.S. president, you know, Mother, of course, Mother Teresa is problematic, but Mother Teresa could be elected president of the United States and she will have that much blood on her hands. Yeah. Um, but this idea that Obama, you know, somehow, like he did, he really tried with the Iran deal. And that was a really important thing to do. And it was heroic and it was impressive. Um, but uh, he's on the same path to hell as any other U.S. president. Yeah. So. Well, so a couple of things to talk about there. The, the first is kind of that last that last thing you were talking about, which is that uh, something that we fail to realize in the United States is that any incoming U.S. president, especially if he didn't grow up in the State Department, which is uh, zero percent of presidents, um, <laughs> has no experience dealing with the military, has no experience dealing with the intelligence agencies, dealing with these people who tell them, we know we've been doing this for 30 years. We know what we need to do. And if you want to look at sort of that arc through the Obama presidency, I think I think targeted drone strikes uh, and assassinations and the way they spike early on and then draw down is him finally developing the confidence to tell these dudes in the CIA, yeah, no, no, no more. I finally understand my own foreign policy role. And maybe maybe the culmination of that is the uh, is the Iran deal. Finally, the ability to say, I know what's going on uh, and I can oppose you and sell my own agenda. But... The other thing here is, is somebody might reasonably ask us, because uh, I'm pretty much in agreement with everything you just said. Somebody might reasonably ask us, all right, so Syria is going on. It's 2010, 2011. Um, it's horrible. It seems like we ought to do something. Now, there's, there's a name for this in international relations, and it's called, it's called the duty to protect. And it's part of this uh, literature that grew up after the end of the Cold War that asks, all right, we're the only guy in the scene what do we do with that? There, you know, there has to be some duty involved with being the strongest dude on the scene. So what do we do? And one of the big things that shaped our thinking around duty to protect uh, was the genocide that went on in Rwanda. Because we had guys on the ground uh, who were uh, UN forces that sat by and did nothing as the Rwandan genocide went, went on. And there's there's a documentary I had to watch like four times in school, which is pretty heart wrenching. But That's interesting. Um, you had to watch that four times in school. Yeah, a ton, a ton, in, man. In high school? No, 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 in, in college. Yeah, Georgetown. No, no. Well, actually, yeah, Georgetown, the, the home of few, for, uh, future foreign service officers, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're really, yeah, yeah. really pushing that duty to protect thing pretty hard, huh? Well, I mean, uh, I think I think based on the, just the quality of the professors, and not all professors at that school, the professors I happen to have uh, that talked about that, they were talking about the attraction and the dangers of duty to protect. So, yeah, you know, it, it may be incumbent upon the strongest actor in the world to, to do something about terrible situations that are going on. Can, can you still hear me? It seems like my I mic's... Can hear you. Okay, all right. Um, but then once you've decided that... And I, I'm, I think I'm on this side. I think I'm on the side of duty to protect, that there is some duty... Uh, when you see something horrible going on, that national sovereignty isn't the be-all and end-all of international relations. But but you then ask me, what should we have done in Syria when there was still time to do something, right? And I was one of those people. I was one of those people that wanted to do something. Um, Maya Jabali, who's now a much, much more successful uh, journalist than I, than I ever have been or ever will be, who writes for AFP uh, out of Beirut, she and I, our last year of college, we were talking about starting, uh, you know, the second incarnation of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and signing up, you know, hundreds of Americans to go fight in that, the Syrian War. It's funny that that is a very twenty-two-year-old thing to do. Yeah. When I was that age. 
Uh, I the big issue was what Russia was doing to Chechnya. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is 2000 in 2000 2002. I have a website that's long been taken down, and I was like, yeah, I was like, what the what the what what the world needs now is a Lincoln Brigade for Chechnya, uh, which you know is horrifying. Horrifying. Which, anybody who doesn't know uh, the Second Spanish Republic in 1936. Uh, one of its generals named Francisco Franco, who was with the army in Morocco, raised a fascist rebellion. Uh, the Spanish Civil War raged for four years. The Western democracies provided no aid because there were too many socialists and communists in the Spanish Republican government. Uh, and what they ended up sending instead, unofficially, uh, on the part of the citizens, were brigades of international fighters who signed up uh, to go fight for the Spanish Republic. And the most famous of those was the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Uh, which came from uh, and this included folks like George Orwell, Ernest Hemingway. This is where from whom the for whom the bell tolls, I believe, is uh -huh. about. Yeah, and homage to Catalonia. Homage to Catalonia, Orwell's book, and uh, for whom the bell tolls is tremendously <laughs> significant. I think that uh, all of our parents would know what the Lincoln Brigade was, or or you know would, would or maybe our grandparents at this point. Um, but uh, now that I mean, we could also go down the. Uh, um, you know, the foreign fighters in Syria actually are, uh, I would say, yeah, they're, they're uh, fighting the that, exactly. brigade, yeah. but, uh, but that's, that's problematic. Of course, we would have been fighting on the side of truth and justice. Right? Obviously. That's the difference. But uh, any, anyway, my point is, I was one of those people that wanted to do something, right? Mm -hmm. And at the time, I probably would have wanted just some sort of military intervention, right? That's what I was looking for. But mm -hmm. I think now, a little bit of perspective, and especially perspective on the way things worked in Vietnam, uh, I think the duty, protect, duty to protect exists, uh, but I think maybe the way to address it is you take a moment, like, uh, give me the year here, Rob, 2011, 2012 in Syria, uh, you know, but it's just kicking off. 2011, 2012. Uh. I, th I think what you have at that moment is not a speech from the president, not one speech, but if you're, if you're entertaining even the idea of, of mapping some sort of operation with the duty to protect, it's got to be a months long conversation with the American people. What is it that we're willing to commit to this? What do we think is right? What's going to work? Uh, because well, we Obama, time and again, that discussing that within the circles of power and acting on it is a, a recipe for disaster. Obama actually did that in 2013, though, uh, if you recall. Remember, okay. he went to Congress and, uh, you know, this, that and the other thing. And Congress said no. And uh, and I'm glad. I mean, as, as angry as I am about that CIA program that was allowed to go forward, I'm very glad we didn't get involved. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. Because Except, the idea that we weren't involved in Syria back then is fucking nuts. We were the main reason the place was disintegrating. Yeah, which is uh, what I'm saying, that there was this conversation in 2013, but that didn't prevent any of the CIA programs from going forward. It didn't prevent any of the funding from going forward. Because, I mean, you know, in my ideal world, Obama comes to the people and says, look, look, we want to support these guys. Bashar al-Assad is obviously a monster. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not great that people are getting killed. Um, but look, here's the deal. If we give billions of dollars to these rebels, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of more people are going to die. That is the cost of us helping this out. Is that the cost that we want to bear? Is that the moral burden that we as the United States want to bear as part of the duty to protect? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the honest conversation that's never going to happen because we no. stopped talking to the American public in 1952. Yeah. Um, um, I'm, well, I think we, I mean, the question of Lying and poly, you know, what was the, what's that famous Philip Larkin poem? It's like uh, uh, sex was invented in 1963 or something like that. No, it's like lying in politics did not begin with Vietnam. Um, but yes, it certainly took a whole new form and a new uh, new new approach with the duty to protect. I'm tremendously uh, uh, skeptical of the duty to protect. And I would say very much against it. Uh, but I would say that if we do have, if we can ever get to a point where the United Nations, everybody in the United Nations, it's important to remember, as we had in Libya with China and Russia, they were like, yes, okay, we're convinced, go do it. Like if we have that, like the entire world on board, uh, this is interesting in that sort of Russia and China are like, you know, I'm internalizing them as my sovereignty protectors. Like in that case, if there's something so egregious, which I would imagine Rwanda in 94, you know, might have might have gotten there, um, that even China and Russia are like, yeah, that's fucked up. Let's go deal with that. Then, yes, in that case, I would be willing to endorse a duty to protect type operation. Failing that, no fucking way.
um, the United States has proved itself over and over again to be completely incapable of making these judgments in any kind of any kind of rational way. Um, the 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 another thing about that Rwanda stuff, I need to look into this more. But my understanding is not just that the Tutsi Hutu thing was a creation of outside influence during the Belgian, um, uh, the sort of, I think it was Belgian or French uh, colonial period, but also the the sort of the run-up, I need to read into this further, but the run-up to the actual genocide involved a lot of French manipulation throughout the 80s and 90s. So actually Rwanda isn't a great case for foreign intervention. It's a great case for foreigners staying the fuck out because yeah. it may have actually started the Rwanda genocide. I don't, I haven't read enough about that to back that up with any with any sincerity, but I do intend to at some point. Also, the the whole humanitarian intervention thing. I did a video about this years ago called uh, "Why Humanitarian Intervention Is Dumb." Um, the first, you know, what the first um, big human rights, um, you know, uh, group. Sorry, for, first. Uh, per persecuted group that was seen by the international community of the great powers worth as worth protecting was. Do you know? Do you know who those were? Uh, Greeks, maybe. Eggs, fucking exactly. It was the Armenian and Greek minorities of the Ottoman Empire in the late, um, in the late nineteenth century. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, not sure. I mean, I'm pretty sure most of our publics know how that went. Uh, there are no more Greeks or Armenians uh, in the territory of the Ottoman Empire. You've heard of the term Armenian genocide. Uh, so that's generally what happens to the beneficiaries of uh, our duty to protect. Uh, because as in that case, of course, uh, the French and Russian um, championing of the, the religious minorities of the Ottoman Empire were always about political, um, political aims, just as our championing of the persecuted in Syria was always about political aims and the fact that Syria was one of the few countries that did not participate in our sort of uh, liberal world order. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, duty to protect. The, I don't like it. The thing about it, the thing about it, and from a, my more, you know, my 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 great age now of uh, 27 and 10 days, uh, mm -hmm. talking about duty to protect, um, I think there's a much more effective method of intervention than, than we've literally ever used before uh, in the history of the United States that could be deployed in virtually every one of these situations. Uh, and that is an outgrowth of our position as the world's greatest economic power, you know, for however long that lasts, um, which is that our first thought is always, well, who are we going to blow up? You know, mm -hmm. is it going to be free fly zones? Is it going to be uh, targeted bombings? Is it going to be special forces guys? You're never going to get rid of that element of it because uh, we're obsessed with all that stuff. But, um, you know, uh, say, our, say our approach in Syria is going to be too pronged, right? We're going to fund the rebels. Uh, and then what the only ethical, natural partner of that uh, would be to accept millions of refugees. That is that uh, our strategy with uh, Bashar al-Assad is we're literally going to depopulate um, the areas that rebels control. We're going to take everyone. Because that's the, that's the only, you know, if you want to look at effective intervention in Rwanda, well, you're not going to be able to, with foreign guns, stop whatever's going on uh, in those days in 94. But what you could do is just let every one of those people who wants to get out, get out. Mm -hmm. um, it's insane that the United States takes such a small proportion of the world's refugee population when it has such a large role in creating that same refugee population. Now, I don't, I, I, like mean, I, I don't think... People, but I'm saying... If we're going to get involved in other countries, the only uh, ethical thing to partner with that is that we got to take everybody that we end up fucking their lives up. Uh, it's not a great sentence. Yeah. So we're so we're facilitating ethnic cleansing for folks. Is that uh, we should? I'm, we should, I'm saying we once we've begun to facilitate it, then we need to take the people who need to get out. Well, but that's the, the, I don't know. I, I don't think any of the uh, these processes work quite as quickly. Um, no, uh, obviously not. I'm talking about ideal worlds here. Well, the, the thing is, and I talk about this a lot, is we actually do have um, a very effective strategy and uh, uh, battery of tools to use against nasty dictators who are, and we've used it over and over and over again. You fucking bribe them. Uh, we were already well on our way towards the same result uh, in Syria. I mean, Bashar Assad um, 
is the heir, son and heir of Hafez Assad. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm getting that appropriately. Uh, who is like a legitimate, uh, this is circa 2010, legitimate horror show of a guy. I mean, you know, you know flattened Hama, you know, tr true nightmare. Uh, Bashar, um, while he wasn't as, as liberalizing as quickly um, as everyone had hoped and had the uh, uh, serious um, uh, burden of uh, the United States invading um, the country next door in his like year two of his uh, leadership, um, like was really super freaking interested. I mean, just look at the way this guy uh, uh, presents himself visually. It's all, you know, Hafez Assad, sometimes in a suit, sometimes in a uniform. Bashar Assad, I have I mean, there's got, maybe there's a picture floating around somewhere of this guy in, in, a, in a uniform, but he's always in a suit, speaks fluent English, even today is eager to be interviewed by any um, U.S. journalist who wants to go and come in and ask him any question in English. Um, that's it was fascinating. Uh, there's somebody in the YouTube comments linked me to one of those, and I was like, "What? This is from 2018? Like Assad is talking to? It's 2017. Assad is happily talking to Newsweek. I wonder why they didn't show up on Fox News. Um, but like, anyway, I'm uh, sorry. I'm, I'm, but um, but yeah, there's a standard. If you look at Eastern Europe, Latin America, um, all of our Asian tiger buddies standard approach you bribe them you you, you 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 give them cash and prizes you suck them into the world system and pretty soon um you've got uh, a large enough constituency in that country that uh, wants to get rid of him um and whether getting rid of that guy means he goes to a you know pleasant retirement uh, in the chilean countryside um and might you know come back on him 10 20 years later or uh, if he just had a luxury apartment in Moscow, you know, it, it would have been a good deal for the Assad family and it would have been a much and better deal for the Syrian people. And it's what we did in all of communist Eastern Europe, all of Latin America, all of the Asian tiger folks. I mean, people don't quite realize that Indonesia, South Korea, the year I was born, 1979, Indonesia, South Korea, Taiwan, um, the Philippines, uh, all of these successful, relatively successful democratic uh, places had were ruled by monsters in 1979. Uh, folks that make Assad, even you know the the Suharto, the Indonesia guy, even makes Assad circa 2016 after the Syrian war look like a pussycat. Um, um, and yeah. we dealt with these guys very straightforwardly. You you just make their people rich, you make them rich, and they fade away. That's how you actually change regimes. That's how you actually protect and lift people up. And it's very straightforward, and the U.S. has actually been pretty good at it. Um, unfortunately, we have uh, uh, munitions uh, industries. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, pause. Um, I'm going to go to the bathroom. All right. And get a cup of coffee. In mm -hmm. the meantime, uh, you ought to take a look at the chat, unless you're going to do the same thing that I'm going to do. Uh, and then, regarding somebody's uh, comment here, uh, where they asked if we ever talked about Vietnam at all. Uh, right after I get back, we're getting back to the outline because we got two things we're going to cover that are both okay. directly affected with Syria or what we might do in Syria in the next coming weeks. Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to we're gonna finish up with that. So. Two questions and stuff. Okay. And uh, right now I will uh, dive into the chat. Has anybody got a question for me? There's a bit of a delay here. Um, so uh, I'm going to go through this chat. Um, moral relativism. Big fan of moral relativism. Uh, does anybody in the chat have a question for me? It seems like a very active chat. Um, I am uh, not seeing great questions here. It is interesting that uh, it does seem that we're not talking about Vietnam as perhaps we must, uh, perhaps we had promised. Um, but it's, uh, it's, I think, a sign of just how entwined all these issues are. Uh, it's a... Um, uh, history is repeating itself in a very, very direct way. I mean, it's the same. Uh, you look at the, the start of the Vietnam War, uh, or at least not the start, certainly not the start, just like uh, Bush wasn't the start of the Iraq War, but the, the acceleration of uh, the uh, Vietnam War came with the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which was uh, now acknowledged to be an almost completely fabricated incident 
that allowed Johnson to go to the US Congress and get the authorization for a tremendous leap in troop figures. Um, this is very similar to the WMD issue in Iraq. Um, so these things go in cycles, and that's why it's so important um, to, to pay attention to this stuff. Um, have we got a question? America is capitalism on steroids. Well, yes, thank you. I, I, I tend to agree with that. Uh, could Vietnam have been won by money bombing rather than bomb bombing? Um, that is a very interesting question. And I think we had that opportunity. We talked about that earlier with uh, Harry Truman at the end of World War II. We had that opportunity to work with Ho Chi Minh because we had helped. Uh, we had helped to uh, boot, um, we had helped them boot the Japanese out of Vietnam. Um, instead, we made the choice to go with, uh, I guess, a different kind of money choice to prop up remnants of the French Empire. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, the, it wasn't as direct. We weren't quite, I guess we were, but uh, we still wanted to uh, uh, help France preserve its pretensions to empire at that point. Uh, even though we were sort of on at that point, this sort of money bombing, this ability to really just bribe dictators out of existence, um, I think really sort of came after 1989. And I think that's sort of the genesis of the, the democratic revolution that people talk about. Uh, thoughts on the recent Syrian development, the Trump's plan to bomb Syria again. Uh, we will definitely get to that by the end, Max Payne, I assure you. Um, after the documents were leaked, was there any laws passed so that another Vietnam does not happen? <laughs> well, uh, actually, the War Powers Act was yeah. a direct response to what happened in Vietnam uh, because LBJ prosecuted the entire war and later Nixon uh, without any declaration of war. He just had the Tonkin Gulf, Tonkin Gulf Resolution, uh, which was likewise extracted because of some uh, skullduggery. Um, mm -hmm. Problem being that the War Powers Act, uh, we're operating under it right now. There's a, there's a resolution under the War Powers Act uh, that allows the U.S. government to prosecute war anywhere, as long as it somehow has to do with terrorism. Um, Which is why Yemen is kind of low-hanging fruit, because unlike most of the rest of the conflicts, I mean, we're actually working with al-Qaeda there. Um, so that's why uh, Sanders and uh, Mike Lee, who's a Republican, and Chris Murphy, who's a Democrat, uh, got pretty close a couple weeks back in uh, pushing a sort of war powers orient. Um, I may be, I may be uh, crossing some legal lines here, but uh, the uh, uh, in terms of I may be confusing some issues. But the, I believe it was pretty directly related to the War Powers Act and the authorization for the use of military force. Uh, so they introduced a resolution in the Senate that I think lost by fifty, you know, by five or ten votes. Um, trying to get the U.S. out of uh, Yemen. And if that, if that had succeeded, the underlying reason for that would have been the War Powers Act, which came about in the 70s. All right. Um, do we have any more directly Vietnam-related questions? Uh, oh, Jesus. Could the Vietnam conflict have been war won with nuclear weapons? It depends on what you mean by one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean... Uh, if you wanted to just kill everyone in North Vietnam, well, yes, you can kill people with nuclear weapons, certainly. Okay. Or everyone in North Vietnam and, what, a lot of southern China? Um, Yo, oh, yeah. <laughs> just the whole region, yeah. Blow okay. away the entire French colony of Indochina, and certainly the war will be over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can, and that's, that's, that goes to a, a calculation. That, yes, of course, you can definitely win wars by killing everybody. That's how they used to win wars. You take a city, you slaughter everyone, and sell them off for slavery. Not exactly, you can't really, um, uh, kind of hard to square that when your main rationale for being there is to help the Vietnamese people. Yeah. Um, doesn't quite fit with the U.S. self-image. Yeah. Um, so, um, everybody keep, keep putting your stuff in the chat, uh, especially non-Vietnam related questions we'll get to later. Uh, if you have uh, in in the hour and a half of this conversation so far, asked a question specifically about Vietnam that we have not gotten to. Please type it in again, and we'll get to it like uh, almost right now. Um, but the next thing we had in our outline, which I think maybe we can blow away pretty quickly, is the idea of a lost war uh, and the need to reclaim prestige uh, here in the United States. Um, I think I think it's bigger than Vietnam because we didn't really win in Korea either. I think people forget about that now because the memory of Vietnam is kind of 
encapsulated the whole mid-century worth of conflict. Um, and I think the way in which we lost lost Vietnam is is important because uh, it was never a war we were going to be able to win on the ground. We lost we, Vietnam. We lost Vietnam a lot harder than we lost uh, Korea. I mean, yeah, no, no, certainly no South Korea. There's no South yeah. Vietnam. Um, what I mean to say is that uh, the war in Vietnam was lost the second that we decided uh, to champion a regime that didn't really exist versus um, North Vietnam, which was founded upon the successful resistance to the French of the Viet Minh that had massive popular support, uh, that was led by a massively popular leader in Ho Chi Minh, uh, and what's more, a massively popular leader who never engaged in the, in the same kind of stuff that Stalin and Mao did. You know, a massively popular leader who didn't have to lie about what he'd done to maintain that popularity. Mm -hmm. um, and the second we tried to champion a South Vietnamese regime that, that was never there at all, uh, that was the moment we lost the war. And I think because we lost it that way, there's been so much obsession with how we could have won it militarily. Um, you know, if we just bombed a little bit more, if we just bombed more in the north, if we'd invaded the north, if we'd eliminated those zones in Cambodia, uh, because there was never a way to win militarily, except as Loga Cool Extreme pointed out, killing everyone mm -hmm. uh, in the whole region, what it's created is this complex that's gone on till today, that if we could just fight the war the right way, these mm -hmm. wars that shouldn't be fought at all. You know, if we could have just fought Iraq differently in some way, it wouldn't have turned out the way it did. When really the question that we've refused to address since Vietnam is don't why, get into these wars in the first place. Yeah, why were we there? Yeah, And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's seductive. I mean, I think about, I often think about like, well, you know, what if Rumsfeld hadn't fired the entire uh, Iraqi army? Um, you know, what if, what if we hadn't, you know, sent two million guys with guns, uh, uh, you know, made, made two million unemployed guns with, uh, two million unemployed people with guns, um, you know, maybe things would have gone a little bit better. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think that's a great way of um, avoiding the central question, which is, was there a point to any of this in the first place? Yeah. Uh, and there was not. And this is, this is something that, I mean, I mean, is seriously dominant in the culture. Uh, probably, well, at, at least all of our audience that's in the U.S. knows that last fall, Ken Burns produced a 10-part series on Vietnam. Um, I didn't expect it to be very good because Ken, Bur Ken Burns has kind of a rosy view of American history. Mm -hmm. um, and totally lived up to that. Uh, this thesis statement of the very first episode is something like, uh, everybody had good intentions, <laughs> it, this war was an accident, uh, and then never addresses the question of why we got there in the first place again. And what he does, like everybody else who talks about the war, is about how we fought it. Mm -hmm. well, question. The question isn't how we fought it or how we could have fought it better. I mean, once you're in, maybe, maybe, you know, once we've destroyed the Iraqi state and killed Saddam Hussein, yeah, maybe there's questions at that point because we can't go back in time about, yeah, don't fire the army, uh, you know, create a better coalition or whatever. But and the I, question I, we need to be focused on to avoid another Iraq is don't do it in the first place. How do we see the, the thing we shouldn't do? And I think what, why history is so important here is I think the standard objection to someone who looks at Iraq in 2003 and was like, this guy's horrible. He gassed his people. Da, 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 da. It's like, yeah, but why, who created Saddam Hussein? Who created, like, that's the thing. All of these, all of these conflicts have much deeper roots than the, the big 2003 invasion moment or the big 1964 Gulf of Tonkin, uh, Johnson goes heavily into, into Vietnam moment. Um, uh, so that's like, we're trying to answer these larger questions. We're not saying that Saddam Hussein or Bashar Assad, you know, circa 2018 are good people. We're, we're asking the, the question that should be asked, which is like, how are these situations created? Because Iraq was very much created by the United States or the Iraq issue was very much created by the United States, as was the Vietnam issue. Uh, someone had asked, uh, I think it was a Vietnam question, and maybe you can, how serious was Ho Chi Minh about communism? Was it something that he always espoused, or was it something he sort of jumped in on later on when he knew he could get support against the Americans and the French, or how was that? how did that work? So Ho Chi Minh, from birth, is a nationalist. Ho Chi Minh's father is a nationalist. He participates in the first major rebellion against the French. Ho Chi Minh is born into nationalism. But until he gets to France at the end of the First World War, after sort of a world tour on uh, working on different ships, uh, he's not 
any particular brand of political except for nationalist. Yeah. But what happens is he gets to France at that point and the only party, the only party of all of the parties uh, active at the time that espouses national liberation for the colonized people uh, is the Socialist Party. And not just the Socialist Party, but the, the half of it that decides to join the Third Communist International. Hmm. Uh, because the French socialists, the ones who were in government, all espoused holding on to the colony of Indochina. Mm -hmm. um, now, you could say at that point in the world, there was one other thing going on, which was enlightened capitalism as espoused by Woodrow Wilson and the 14 mm -hmm. points. Problem being, as much as Toe liked the Americans throughout his whole life, even up to 1966, when they were waging war on his country, Mm -hmm. The problem is, Ho had done long tours up and up, up and down the U.S. eastern seaboard, and he'd already seen the way that the United States treated its own Negro population. Mm -hmm. That's a weird word to use. I've been reading a lot of books from the period, but but the point is, Ho had already seen it. The only people that he knew in the whole world who really espoused anti-colonialism were communists, and not just communists, but Marxist-Leninists out of Moscow. So he was a communist from the yeah. Okay. But the thing that people have pointed out is that he was never a man of theory, right? Yeah. There's no little book, there's no little red book for, for Ho Chi Minh. And the only thing like it is a book of poetry he wrote while he was in prison, mm -hmm. um, which is totally apolitical. Um, he, so he was always happy to follow the dictates of common turn. Mm -hmm. uh, but what he was most concerned about was independence for Vietnam. He wasn't concerned about creating a world communist order. But uh, yeah, he was a communist the whole life his whole life long. Uh, and what he tried to implement in North Vietnam once he was in power there was communism. But yeah. the way that you can look at it is that in China under Mao, when it looks like collective farming isn't working out, mm -hmm. they double down until millions of people have died of famine. Mm -hmm. In North Vietnam, collective farming doesn't really work out. So they dial it back and they make it sort of collective, a little bit free market. Uh, he's communist. He wants to work towards Marxist Leninist ideas, but if they don't work out, he just dials it back. Mm. There's there's almost there's almost literally nothing objectionable in like the entire life of Ho Chi Minh. Almost. <laughs> well, I, I, that that may very well be true, but it's also, I mean, as is, uh, it, it, if your entire life is spent fighting very virtuously against outside aggressors, you know, mm -hmm. you're not gonna, you know, if if Stalin's entire career was fighting against Hitler, we'd probably be have a pretty sunny impression of Stalin as well. Yeah, uh, but but my point is that uh, in the early years of North Vietnam, they do mm -hmm. a collective, they do a collectivization movement in the the farms, and they kill a bunch of landlords. They kill like two thousand landlords, or, or mm -hmm. the number may be quite a bit higher. Like I said, I haven't gotten there in the show yet. But what I do know enough to know is when that same situation prevails in China. We never know if Mao's underlings really told him what was going on in the countryside. We never know if he took enough of an interest to ever actually find out. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do know in Vietnam is that Ho Chi Minh was horrified. He fired all the guys who had instituted the collectiviz collectivization effort, uh, and he dialed it back. Oh, interesting. They, 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 they did a rectification they, campaign. They didn't do collectivization in Vietnam? They did. Uh, it didn't work out so hot, so then they, they dialed it back to sort of a half and half. Mm -hmm. And th there was a fair amount of brutalizing of the South Vietnamese, right, after they, uh, um, after they won, right? I mean, I'd expect there would be. Uh, I gotta get there. I think probably less, um, less than, is than so we'd imagine in the American popular imagination, probably more than I would want. Um, but I think what mainly happened, I mean, there, there, were, there were literally there were millions, probably, well, there were millions of refugees, right? Yeah. Cause they were all afraid that that was what was going to go on because the South Vietnamese government had been selling this propaganda of brutal communist northerners for as long as, so I, I think the majority of the people that died in the North Vietnamese repression after they won the war were probably functionaries of the South Vietnamese regime. But don't quote me on any of that, guys. All right. So, um, I look forward to I look forward to listening to that episode. I'll get to uh, it. the uh, um, so have we have we got a bit more in the in the agenda. So if we think we've, we're pretty much done with the idea of regaining prestige, which I think we already kind of talked about in the Iraq wars. Yeah, well, um, the, Persian, the Persian Gulf in 1990, 19, I still can't remember the appropriate year, uh, that war was pitched and uh, described as wiping away the stain of Vietnam, dear, you know, doing away with Vietnam syndrome. Uh, I consider myself to be a proud, continued sufferer of Vietnam War syndrome, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it would be good if the rest of us were as well. Yeah. Um, Actually, I have one thing here that will roll us into the next 
the next uh, topic on the outline. We will roll us into Syria in a pretty neat fashion. All right. All right. So, um, so I think I think there's every new generation of American people uh, need their own war. Um, there's not 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 as a good thing, mm -hmm. um, but kids like me, right? I grew up. I'm pretty well educated. Both my parents served in the military. Uh, thankfully, did not participate in the uh, invasion of Grenada. Um, I grew up. I watched Saving Private Ryan. I watched Band of Brothers. I watched these hay geographies of the Second World War. I look at the fact that we have the largest military in the world, which is totally contrary to what the founding fathers would have wanted, because uh, it's unhealthy for democracy to have the largest military in the world. But I, like all other American youth, I play war games, I play soldiers, I imagine myself in these in these movies, and I go, man, what are we going to use this army for? What's the great next democratic crusade, right? Uh, and it takes something like the Iraq War for at least half of us to snap out of that and go, Jesus Christ, what are we thinking about doing here? That it's never going to be another Second World War, you know, blowing up Iraq uh, and defeating Saddam Hussein, it's never going to give us that feeling it gave us that the greatest generation had. Uh, and if you dig back into it, World War II wasn't nearly as glorious as we think it is now. Um, we're we're looking we're looking for a war that's never going to happen again and that never existed in the first place. Um, and I think part of that rolls into what is the next topic on our outline, uh, which I have down here is deification of the soldiery. So Rob, I, I don't know how comfortable you're going to be with this. I don't know if you added any notes to the, to the outline here, but there's a dynamic uh, in American history that plays out between the second world war, Korea, Vietnam, and today. And what it is, is in the second world war, soldiers become heroes. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense because even though we had the draft, I don't know what the percentages are, but a huge proportion of the guys who went overseas and fought in the Second World War were volunteers. They stepped up. They saw the needs of world democracy. They had to fight the Nazis, and at the time, the fascist Japanese and volunteered. Heroic, right? Okay. Korea is kind of this transitionary point, uh, and it's, it's their forgotten war in general. And then we get to Vietnam. And what happened is that the anti-war movement, um, for whatever reason, for a reason that I think, a lot of reasons that I think are incredibly misguided, ends up turning against the soldiers themselves. Uh, which baby, makes, baby killers, etc. Yeah. Uh huh. Which makes a tiny bit of sense because the atrocities that American soldiers were committing were publicized for the first time. It wasn't the first time that happened; it was the first time they did it on the television. My um, love. Yeah, but what makes less sense uh, is that this was the war that had like the least proportion of volunteers. None of these guys wanted to go over there, uh, and even the guys that ended up doing horrible shit, like my life or me life, uh, obviously that's not excusable. But the and, and they deserve to be punished, but the real culpable party is the U.S. government that sent these untrained dudes into a situation that they had, they were totally unequipped to handle. Um, so there was this, this liberal reaction against the soldiers themselves, which was bad and didn't make sense, but the reaction to that reaction was on the part of the Nixon Nixonian silent majority, and what it ended up going into by the time we got to the first and second Gulf Wars was the idea that any guy who serves in the U.S. military, like the moment he becomes a soldier, he's a hero. Now, uh, I've, I've had this talk with my dad, uh, and uh, he doesn't like it uh, because he's a veteran. Uh, not of foreign wars, but at least of military service. Um, and what I'm not trying to do is shit on American soldiers. But I'm trying to introduce the idea that it's not natural. It doesn't make any sense that signing up for the military in the United States in this day and age makes you a hero. Now... Why do I think that is? If you're going to defend that idea, you ask somebody, why did you join up? And they say, I want to defend our freedoms, right? I want to defend our freedoms. Well, when is the last time uh, an American military effort overseas has been directed to the direct defense of American freedoms? I think you now, could... Sorry. You, 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 can make, you can make a large argument about defending the American world order, uh, but that's an imperial argument. It's not an argument about defending U.S. soil, about defending actual U.S. freedoms. It's about defending U.S. economic interests, about U.S. interests in the world political order. And uh, Rob, you, you give me the you give me the take notes because you give me the whole the critique on this whole spiel. But the reason that it concerns me, the reason that this deification of the soldiery confer, concerns me, is not that soldiers get onto the plane in front of me, right? It's not that people thank them for their service. That's fine. That's that's all great. The problem is that we operate in an environment right now where the American president 
can declare, well, cannot declare war, but send soldiers to any theater in the entire world without ever consulting the American people. Once those soldiers are there, there's no way to get them out. There's no way to not perpetuate or to support the troops. So we get 10 advisors in a country, well, four of them died. Now we got to put more investment there. You know, half the Congress, even even the liberal side of the Congress is going to be saying, well, we got to support the troops. We got to we got to vote more money for these guys. We got to put more dudes on the ground. What the support for the troops, what this irrational deification of the soldiery ends up creating uh, is opportunities for an executive to create war out of the ether. And it's not even a legitimate deification of the soldiery because as soon as they're back here, we forget about them. Yeah. Um, I, I think the uh, I am absolutely against the deification of the soldiery. I think it was a logo cool extreme says all soldiers are brave, are brave. All leaders are dogs and monsters. Uh, I think that's a slight oversimplification, but I think that is the appropriate that is the appropriate approach. I think that yeah. as far as defending freedom, um, I, I think I, I would still make the case for obviously it was something that was created by the U.S. government, but I would make a case for. Uh, uh, our initial involvement in Afghanistan was was defending the United States uh, in 2001. Um, I, 2002, 2001, 2002, I would, I'd make that case. I largely agree. I do think, though, that there needs to be... I, I only detected a hint of um, sort of this sort of contempt for... Um, I mean, like, we're both obvious, like, incredible nerds on this topic. Um, but I know a lot of people who um, uh, are similarly educated or whatnot, and completely buy uh, this whole um, this whole myth of U.S. benevolence. Um, you know, most most Obama supporters buy that shit. Um, uh, you know, this uh, this vision of uh, the United States protecting freedom and just going out and helping folks. And uh, I'm tremendously leery of trying to make. Um, ever trying to blame certainly you know the enlisted folks or even the officers who um uh, uh who get involved for the evils of um the ev the legitimate evils of the u.s government uh the yeah, I, have, I have friends sorry it's not and that's what's difficult to talk about here that's what i mean that's 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 the intention of, of a propaganda of the soldiers it becomes impossible to talk about the problem because we're worried about yeah. Offending the sensibilities of, or it's it's not about the soldiery. Yeah. It's people creating the propaganda about the. Sorry, anyway. Rob, I have a, I have a couple friends I went to college with, uh, three actually. Who and I mean, they're pretty freaking high. Um, I bet it's. Well, I guess I am coming from a different era. Um, but you know, go from the University of Michigan. Good friends of mine. Um, one guy was a couple years younger. I can think of three guys. Who not who weren't Rats? Well, I can think of actually if you include Rats people. I can think of a, a, a good deal more, but I can think of three guys specifically. Uh, four, I guess, four good friends specifically. One of them was Rats, but who chose uh, to get into the military after? And this was a very different era. This was you know 2000, uh, 2002, three, four, five. Um, and I think the way that they saw it wasn't so much necessarily, I think, well, I definitely certainly don't think they were as deep into um, the the evils of the military industrial complex as we are, but I don't think it was so much uh, rah, rah, America, though there was an element of it as a, I want to do my part. Um, like, you know, I come from a, you know, I'm maybe a more privileged person from a town in Michigan and uh, I see all these poor bastards who, you know, this is their only way forward and they're forced into it. You know, these people I might have, you know, played with in high school or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, I, I'm not going to be exempt from this. And I, I actually do think there is something noble to that, to people who volunteer even today. Um, because I also do believe that there is a role for uh, U.S. military power as far as sort of garrisoning the, the new world order at this point, um, even though the way that it's used. That said, I am in complete agreement about the deification of the soldier and how it's used. I think it's, I think it's horseshit. Uh, soldiers are absolutely deserving of our respect and um, our, uh, you know, we should honor their choice to, 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 to do service. Um, but as far as what really bothers me is this deference to generals now. Um, yeah. Uh, with the Secretary of Defense Mattis, honestly, um, I, I completely, there are two things I believe. I believe that he is um, 
tremendously vital uh, to the uh, ongoing security of the world. The fact that a relatively sane, trustworthy, and competent person is at the sec is in that Secretary of Defense position. However, at the same time, I recognize how horrifying the fact that we're we're relying on a, a man on horseback um, to to keep things together in the United States. I mean, that is some banana republic shit. Yeah. That like like no question like uh, forgive me if that's a loaded term or something like that but I mean that is that is that is strongman dictator garbage and yes we've we've got like you know I, I, there, there's there's a lot more underpinning uh, sort of representative government and whatnot but this the the especially in the post nine eleven era the way that this very, I think, I think a very uh, rational, um, I think, yeah, the reaction to the whole baby killer thing, I think mm -hmm. is appropriate, but the, the, this, this rational, appropriate respect for those who choose to serve their country, the way that it is morphed into this just sort of blanket deference for military men and their choices and their approaches mm -hmm. is insane. Um, and it's really, really problematic. And I, I, I think, um, when we're talking about the fighting man, uh, I, 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 am uh, uh, tremendously um, uh, deferential. But when we're talking about after that fighting man reaches a certain rank in the military, when he's no longer out there fighting and dying with his men and he's making decisions, we should be instantly become dramatically more suspicious. Yeah. Um, like no matter how uh, magnificent a warfighter that person might have been or how dedicated to his people or his flag, the idea that he knows a fucking thing about um, how things should be run in politics is a terrible, uh, terrible assumption. It's amazing how many people I run into in the comments. I do a lot about Islamophobia and how you know it's something we shouldn't work with. And I get a lot of um, folks who uh, are like, you know, fuck Muslims, I, da, 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 da. and I was like, well, have you ever been to a Muslim country is generally my approach. And in, in more than one or two occasions, I've been, yeah, I was there. And then you look into it and it was, yeah, they were in Iraq or Afghanistan where they were put there to kill people. Yeah. Um, and you see that shit on Fox News all the time. And like, as I say in those comments, thank you so much for your service. Thank you for having the courage to do what I would not do. But like the idea that your opinions on Islam or, um, or the Muslim world deserve any fucking deference at all is fucking nuts. Like this idea that you can go there as part of this very hermetic um, uh, thing, living on a base, only really seeing locals to uh, harass them or shoot them or this, that, and the other thing. And then your opinions of the Muslim world should somehow be deferred to. No, that's horseshit. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think, we we need you know you need to keep those two separate ideas in your in your head the, or for me anyway like the yes like the 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 willingness to serve is a noble thing to be applauded but that does not translate into any kind of competence yeah. necessarily necessarily not necessarily you know I'm, I'm, I'm of course employ veterans this that and the other thing but like this idea that they should be automatically be deferred to I mean that's some starship trooper shit no and, and I mean and we're definitely trending in that direction which yeah. is a noble idea service guarantees citizenship yeah. yeah uh that's that's a great movie um but you talk you talk about we shouldn't play veterans yeah totally uh like my dad my mom got really excellent jobs as a gm on the strength of the fact that they were organized because they both served in the officer corps hey yeah perfect uh any any kind of job in that line yeah military excellent training you know what the military is really bad training for uh directing u.s diplomatic relations uh, yeah. it's not great because not because the not because the military makes these guys dumb. Not because the, the, there's some there's some taint. It's that they've been working with hammers their entire life, uh, and you put them in charge of uh, diplomacy that necessarily uses more than hammers. Yeah, uh, and they're going to use hammers. Yeah. Um, so Rob and I were talking about the, much earlier in this episode the deep state uh, and the way it tends to drive U.S. foreign policy into military commitments. Well, the guys that make up that deep state are the same generals that we're now integrating into what should be the civilian administration of the government of the United States. Yeah. It's a really bad. And then, yeah, like it, banana republic shit. Like, yeah, yeah like it's it, it's it is a currently the, this this um, reliance on General Mattis um, is, a, I, I think, this it, situation we've been put into by a completely incompetent uh, president and a guy who's incapable of hiring people that stick around for more than six months. Um, but uh, 
it, we have to acknowledge that if this kind of situation endures, if this, you know, goes on for a second Trump administration and then, oh, I don't know, whoever somebody's saying or not saying comes in after him and, uh, well, you know, gosh, you know, it, it sure had sure worked out really well that we had a general in charge of the secretary of defense. And, you know, why don't we, you know, have generals in all our, you know, national security stuff? Because, you know, they really know what's going on. And yeah, that's, I mean... I don't I, I don't I've always been someone who doesn't think that the republic's going to fall in the next 10, 10 to 25 years. But someone who is concerned that if things continue on the current trajectory, the republic will fall in 50 to 100, 150 years. Uh, like Mattis at the secretary of defense and this idea of generals in all our national security possessions that continuing for more than four years, uh, that that's a, that puts us onto the 10 to 25 year timeline. Um, that is. Banana Republic shit. That may sound paranoid, but that's not. Mm. I don't think that's paranoid. I think that's rational. No. I mean, especially when you consider the fact that uh, we're looking at Mattis to restrain the president. But the, the whole point of the civilian command of the military is it's, that the civilians restrain the military men. Yeah. Uh, it's and a I mean, sick situation when we're looking for the military to restrain the civilian executive. And it's fascinating because, I mean, Mattis is a guy who hates the Iran and the Iranian regime to the to, to the core of his being. I think his the beginning of his career in the Marine Corps was more or less with the the, the embassy bomb. Sorry. Yeah. Is it, is it an embassy bomb? The, no, it's Marine barracks bombing. In yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and uh, we're, you know, 200. Uh, I should know the figure, but a couple hundred Marines were killed by Hezbollah, which fairly or unfairly is attributed to Iran. I mean, this guy hates Iran at the, you know, the core of his being. And it's, it's, he's actually done a much better job than I um, expected. Uh, sort of, you know, he, he's the, he's probably, he's now the only thing standing between the complete end of the Iran deal. Um, so he's actually, you know, the rational guy. Um, and that's a really scary mm -hmm. place to be where a guy in who was actually, I think he was, he was fired from the Obama administration for being too anti-Iran, if I recall correctly. Um, and now he's the guy who's keeping things on, on keel. It's a really scary, scary place to be. Um, all right. So that's, that's what I got. Um, do we have stuff from the comments here? Why is Vietnam? Okay. Why is, well, I mean, we have a, why is Mattis pro Iran deal? Oh, well, should we start with Vietnam questions, maybe? Uh, random question. If you, want to, if you want to do the pro Iran deal thing, I'm I'm going back through all the comments right now. And okay, cool. So I'll, I'll do why is Mattis pro Iran deal? Uh, Mattis is pro Iran deal because he recognizes that uh, throwing that over unilaterally would be like um, Trump's throwing over the climate change thing, except a million times worse. Uh, what Trump is doing here is not. Um, I think I think Mattis actually is definitely an opponent of the Iran deal as signed in 2015. But what he recognizes is what Trump wants to do, which is unilaterally throw over this deal. It's not just a deal between the United States and Iran. It's a deal between the United States, Europe, China, Russia, the, the, something like P plus five or six or something like that. Anyway, it's like a whole ton of countries that have signed on to this. Iran has been compliant with this uh, thing that they signed on for. So China, Russia, especially, and even our traditional allies in Europe are like, what the fuck are you doing? So if Trump decides to not certify the Iran deal, decides to unilaterally back out, we don't just have Russia and China and Iran disagreeing with us on this. We have all of our traditional allies in Europe being, what the fuck? We're supposed to sell, um, uh, you know, I think France has serious oil deals going forward, Airbus, and I think even Boeing. Uh, want to sell, pl finally sell planes to Iran again. Um, and Trump is just throwing all this over. And what people don't realize about the Iran deal was there was a run up to that, that Obama did a very good job of getting the entire world on board with sanctions against Iran. So if we, Mattis recognizes as a very anti Iran person, that if we just throw out the deal, we don't have any levers to pull against Iran other than getting involved in another war. And as a military person and a military leader who would be sending these people to die, and as someone who knows that the challenge of fighting Iran in a war is dramatically worse, uh, dramatically more daunting than uh, fighting Saddam Hussein in Iraq was, um, he knows that getting rid of the Iran deal is insanity because we don't have any levers to use against um, Iran if the rest of the world uh, says fuck the U.S. and we're happy to keep trading with Iran. Um, 
because that's sort of the way that the oil market works. It all sort of goes away. Um, Andy, did you find some Vietnam questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, hold on, some of these are related. All right, I, I think the one I want to take first was, uh, why was Vietnam impossible to win? There's like two or three that kind of build off this. Um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of said this a lot in the episode. I'm not sure if I fully explained it, but so the basic dynamic in Vietnam is that at the end of the war with the French, the Viet Minh have won, uh, but the French have managed to keep South Vietnam relatively free of the Viet Minh, which is the group that Ho Chi Minh leads uh, and in which the uh, Indo-Chinese Communist Party dominates. Right? Um, so what the French do is they sign these accords in 54 that divide the country along the 17th parallel uh, and they set up a national election in four years or something like that. Um, so the U.S., which is by this point sponsoring the South Vietnamese regime under uh, Ngo Dinh Diem, uh, decides to not let these elections happen. Why? Why don't we allow elections to happen to unite the country of Vietnam? Well, because Ho Chi Minh is popular in the entire country. The Viet Minh, because they threw out the French, are popular in the entire country. They would have won. That is, the seat of Vietnamese nationalism is in the north. It resides within the Viet Minh, which we later renamed to the Viet Cong, but they never actually changed their name, um, and in the person of Ho Chi Minh. So for the entire war, what we're supporting is a regime in the South that never had the popular support of anyone. Uh, not the Southern Vietnamese, not Northern Vietnamese, not the Catholics, not anyone. Well, at the very beginning, it had the support of the Catholics, but we were supporting this ghost regime. And the reason we could never win the Vietnam War the way we were fighting it was that we... We were supporting a regime that no one else supported. So and the second that we pulled out, it was going to collapse. Is it, well, and also, wasn't there some support? Like, Jim was able, well, mostly because of the incredible amount of money that he had from the United States to play with, was able to build a little bit of, of, of support until... Until? Well, until... Uh, until uh, he became more authoritarian. We didn't like the way he was acting, and we allowed his generals to assassinate him. Yeah. Uh, but the kind of support that Diem was building was dictatorial support. He was building support among generals and among foreign powers. Yeah. But, but like, it's just it's just a testament to just how stupid our approach to this was. Because yeah. my understanding is, like, what, you know, Diem, things were getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and then we killed Diem. Um, and then things got exponentially worse, you know, uh -huh. sort of necessitating large numbers of U.S. soldiers. So yeah. we just had no idea what we were doing in Vietnam from the get-go, just as we had no idea what we were doing in Iraq from the get-go and still don't have much of an idea today. Yeah. Um, so the corollary to this question is, could we have won the war if we'd spent more money on it? Which somebody mentioned they, they saw in a right-wing propaganda video, question mark, which is, what, what was the university that you mentioned? The YouTube Prager, university? Prager University. I yeah, Prager U. It's nuts, man. They talk a lot about how we could have won the Vietnam War. Yeah, um, it was handsome. Yes, we could have won the Vietnam War. Yes. Uh, what we would have had to have done was eliminate the South Vietnamese regime, made South Vietnam an actual colony, moved hundreds of thousands of Americans there to, to I mean, moved them there, not soldiers, just mm -hmm. citizens, to populate the countryside, to take it away from the guerrillas, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe also eliminated the native Vietnamese population in the South. Yeah. If we'd done all that, we could have won the war. Yeah, I mean, like, like it, it's this basic question. It's like, yeah, actually, you know, if the United States had decided to go full Rome in 1945 um, and basically abandon everything about the United States that was worthwhile, uh, not just, you know, betray our principles in ways that, you know, we talk about all the time, but, you know, go full on genocidal and, um, you know, universal conscription and everybody just goes in and, uh, you know, massacres everybody and uses nature. Sure, we could have taken over the whole goddamn world. We could have done Hitler, you know, easy. Sure. I mean, yeah. not easy. It would have been horrific and horrible and we could have done it. But why the fuck would you want to do that? Yeah. Um, and that's that's the that's the yeah, of course. Which if, should be a response but, to anybody who says you can win the Vietnam War. Yeah. If you'd put, you know, 10, 20 percent of U.S. GDP into and, you know, obviously you can you can you can change those parameters. Like maybe we wouldn't have gone full on genocidal. We would have just, you know, we would just would have done decimation. And, you know, we actually, we already did a lot of uh, extrajudicial killing in Vietnam. But we could have just sort of stepped that up a bit and we could have nuked Hanoi and we could have this, that, and the other thing. But 
what kind of country would we be if we had done that? And it's important to remember that as these right wing folks don't with their sort of focus on lost cause bullshit, um, it's important to remember that the entire time this war was being sold as what we're doing for our Vietnamese friends and brothers. You know, the US public doesn't really want to be Hitler. Shocking, you know? Um, even, you know, even at those points in US history, where you sort of look at our approach to Native Americans or approach to you know, African American populations, like, yeah, like, we don't want to be the bad guy. You know, nobody wants to be the bad guy. So yes, if we wanted to go full on Hitler, we could have won Vietnam. But why would we want to do that? The other thing there too, especially um, not that Hitler has to worm his way into every conversation, but that in the United States is becoming more and more applicable. Um, there was this thing that existed in Weimar Germany after the First World War, which was called the stab in the back yeah. myth. The Dolstasse Legenda. Um, I don't know how to speak German. But the point is, it was a rationale used by militarists like the Nazi party to justify the creation of greater and greater military power. The idea that the war had been lost because of betrayal by politicians on the home front. And it's exactly the same narrative that guys like yeah. Victor David Hansen, Davis Hansen, are trying to sell you on the Vietnam War. Uh, and your reaction should be, that's just a lie. It's yeah. just not true. Now, no, I mean, no, it's true, but it's like, it, it, but the question is like, what, what uh -huh, uh -huh. are you willing, what, what are you willing to have the country you live in be? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the other correlate of this question was, um, could Vietnam have been won by money bombing versus real bombing? Interesting. Well, I don't know, but what it, yes, several times. So in 1945, when the United States is the power that's going to decide whether the French can recolonize Vietnam mm. or will just recognize Ho Chi Minh, who's already become president of the provisional, provisional government of Vietnam, mm -hmm. we could have said yes. Uh, yeah. And we could have had them foreign aid and included them in the sort of corollary of the Marshall Plan that we used in Japan. Done. Yep. Uh, what we could have done in 1954 was allowed a national election to go through, gave them all the money that we were going to get the South, Viet South Vietnamese regime, and done. There's no Vietnam War. Yeah. Uh, and it's what we ended up doing in the end. The yep. Vietnam War ended, and the Vietnamese people, as they have been several times over the last eight or nine decades, were incredibly magnanimous in saying, bygones, bygones, come right back in, let's trade. Yep. Uh, which is exactly the situation in Vietnam right now. Yep. Uh, if I've, I've got tons of friends who have gone and visited, and they said, yeah, they want you to go see the Museum of the U.S. War because they think it's pretty shitty what you did, but they're very happy to have you, and they're the nicest people in the world. Um, yeah, uh, last night I watched uh, We Were Soldiers, which is pretty much the last, I think, big, well, except for Tropic Thunder, of course, uh, big ticket uh, Vietnam War uh, movie that came out in mm -hmm. 2002. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've sort of followed up on the bit, and it's, it, the, the movie does a great job. Uh, yeah, I think it does a, uh, on balance, a great job depicting this just horrific battle, Battle of La Drang Valley or something like that, and just the brutalization that went on. And I sort of did some wikipedia after the fact. And um, in the early 90s, before um, uh, diplomatic relations had been reestablished between the United States and Vietnam, uh, the, the, oh gosh, Colonel? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, well, he's now, he finished up a major general or whatever, but he, yeah, at the time, general, but at, the time he, yeah, at the time, he was, uh, he was a, uh, a colonel, and uh, a significant portion of his of the four or 500 guys he led there, you know, 25 of them went to the Vietnam, went to that battlefield and uh, were welcomed by the Vietnamese government and met some of the guys they were fighting against. Uh, like, mm -hmm. and this was, I mean, this is when, when, I mean, this is barely 30, barely 25 years after the battle. Um, and some of that, I think we do kind of, um, well, uh, actually, um, so, and I think, um, uh, Southeast Asia is full of, uh, so Ellie Lohan, the question just asked was, Southeast Asia is full of ex-US expat colonies today. Cambodian cash machines spit out dollars. Are you sure we didn't win? Um, that's, I don't know, actually I think that's, yes, that's true. And we, as, as John pointed out earlier, we could have won like that in 1945. We could have won like that in 1954. This whole thing was a fucking waste of time mm -hmm. because as anybody who knew anything about the region in 1945 could have told you, um, and is very much the reason, I think, why the Vietnamese are so very welcoming and magnanimous today, is the Vietnamese 
hate China. Have for thousands of years. Will forever. And they see the United States as their best protection against uh, China. So we could have spent those trillions, like how amazing would it have been actually from a geostrategic perspective if today in 2018, you know, China didn't just have uh, 150 rich Japanese on one end, but they also had another Japan right below them, mm -hmm. you know, because that's pretty much what we could have fucking had, you know? Yeah. That's what we could have, we could have, we could have rebuilt Vietnam. I mean, that, that oversimplifies Japan has a history of development that's very different from, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, colonial uh, abuse by France, but actually Vietnam's already trending in that direction today. Mm -hmm. So we could have, so yeah, so it could have been more like another South Korea. Um, yeah, in the so South Korea, Korea, without having to partner with a pretty uh, distasteful authoritarian in the beginning. Yeah, the South Korea with a communist Democrat. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and also, I mean, Viet gosh, Vietnam's population is significantly larger than Korea, South Korea. It's pretty large. I mean, let me, I'll look it up right now. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, like that's that's what we screwed up. And yes, that, I mean that's the amazing thing is that yeah, of course, because Vietnam, you know, as it did in 1945, 1964, 1975, really hates China. Yeah, we we kind of won, or something like that. Um, but yeah, that could have happened a lot sooner. Um, uh, yeah, about twice the population. Yeah. Um, bu 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 now this this was an interesting question. I'd be interested to hear your opinion on it. Which is why are there no anti-war marches now as there were during the Vietnam War? People, uh, we, we don't have the the folks, the very few people that we actually put in harm's way today um, are there very very voluntarily, and and because I mean it's their job, they're chomping at the bit to go. In fact, um, I when the first um, I was hanging out with some uh, military types when the first I believe they call it Marine Expeditionary Unit last year went into Syria and um, and these are very savvy folks who, who, who are fully aware of the disaster that is Syria but they're just like god damn it they would they really wanted to be there um, and that's I mean that's the all volunteer military uh, the, there's no there's nobody being we are you know we're, we're not seeing sons and brothers and, and fathers forced uh, into um, into warp so we don't we don't have any skin in the game anymore um, and also this whole drone war thing, it's, um, while I think for the long-term trajectory of U.S. empire, U.S. health or whatnot, I think you can argue that what's going on right now is significantly worse than the Vietnam War. It doesn't touch American people. Yeah. It doesn't. And there I, was. Sorry. No, 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 no. You got it. You got it. And also the, you know, I would uh, hope, I think we're beginning to see bits of it, that, um we could, we could, well, actually, no, we're not. Um, I think that having, you know, the U.S. Milit the U.S. media um, was so um, bought in, and this is an accurate sort of right-wing view. The U.S. media was, you know, mostly because Obama's a more attractive individual, uh, was much more bought in to the whole Obama thing. Um, and uh, the significant anti-war movement uh, during the Bush era just sort of disappeared. I mean, there's some websites and, and, you know, lone Twitter freaks out there, you know, still still pushing that. But that disappeared when Obama became president because, well, it's Obama's there. It's fine. And even though he dramatically expanded um, uh, the footprint of uh, the what is no longer known as the war on terror, uh, nobody really paid attention. And now Trump actually, you know, I mean, two weeks ago, Trump and his, was talking about getting out of Syria. I mean, Trump's a lot more anti-war than Obama was, um, which, you know, in his rhetoric. Um, and yes, he's because he is completely lacking in mental and organizational capacity. He's being snowed by um, the, 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 the people that surround any president uh, much more quickly than Obama was. Um, but, uh, but, you know, his instincts are kind of anti-war. What's really, really disturbing right now is um, how much I'm agreeing with Tucker Carlson um, who was a Fox News personality. Um, I think, you know, of course, in his half hour, hour long show, there's three segments about how brown people are scary. But then he'll he'll talk about Syria and he'll be like, why is this in our interest? Um, I think he's a little too, uh, I think he's choosing to die on the, did Assad really use chemical weapons hill a little too much? I think the consensus yeah. is he, he, he did. Um, though this last one is kind of like, why the fuck would you do that? 
Um, but uh, but no, I mean, he's asking legitimate questions, and he's like, you know, he had some senator on and was like. So why are we going after Assad? And the senators were like, well, it's very important to fight ISIS. He was like, yeah, well, what the fuck does going, you know, bombing Assad have to do with fighting ISIS? Um, so, yeah, it's, I don't think the, I think that the protest movement we had in the Bush years was very um, into the sort of left-wing, right-wing marketing segmentations. And those things are still too screwed up. And uh, we had Samantha Power giving all these earnest talks about how it was a new Rwanda that we weren't fighting Assad. So, and while there's there's a switch, there's a partisan switch that can be made, um, when you've got Trump, um, you've got a media that wants to attack Trump for saying, I think, one of the only sensible things on Syria that's ever been said by a president, like, let's get the fuck out of here, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks back. Um, you've got the media that attacks that because they're still remembering Obama and Samantha Power and all these people who are capable of stringing sentences together and went to the right schools. Um, saying, you know, really affecting stuff, about duty to protect, uh, despite the fact that if you actually look at, like, I think probably the nastiest thing that happened in the last two years in Syria is probably our taking of Rakah. But, um, um, yeah. So, again, I have my own little perspective on this one, uh, which is that, uh, you know, if you want to look at uh, sort of tides of history, you know, the way they ebb and flow, um, it seems to me that if you're going to talk about protest as a general phenomena, a uh, phenomenon rather, uh, 1968 was kind of a high point uh, for protest. You've got, um, well, 1968 was, was the point at which the tide began to ebb again, right? Mm -hmm. You've got uh, the Chicago convention in 68, uh, where the mayor daily calls in hundreds, like a hundred thousand policemen and brutalizes uh, a giant anti-war protest. Uh, you've got the riots in Paris in the same year. Uh, Mexican protesters in the square of Plata Loco in Mexico City get murdered by the thousands by the Mexican government. Um, thousands? Thousands. The numbers, numbers have never come down again, but uh, there was hundreds of people dead in the square and then hundreds of people dead in the streets around. They cleaned them up before before daylight. Mm -hmm. um, but any, in any case, 1968 was like the year that the counterculture began to swing back to reaction is is my impression you know you have kent state in what 73 and and so, stuff that happens afterwards 70, 70 okay um but what ends up happening is sort of maybe the nadir of this swing is when the baby boomers who participate in the counterculture become yuppies and participate fully in the Reagan revolution um, and there were there were big protests in the U.S. after the beginning of the Iraq War, and there was somewhat of a protest movement. I think now in 2018, 50 years later, we're just finally starting to remember how to protest again, which is sustained uh, at the you know in danger of losing your job and your position. You know, I, I was fascinated with the with the 1960s counterculture, and I thought when I got to college, we'd be protesting stuff, but only the weirdos who weren't worried about not looking like good, upstanding, young, preppy college students but people who were out protesting and i was still possessed of this sort of post 9 11 culture where i had to be i had to be one of the serious people at the table uh one of the people who's going to be a foreign service officer that's interesting to that's interesting to hear so 10 years later you, there's still an affection uh for that whole counterculture thing like was that you or like you would you say more broadly that there was a you know, this sort of, oh, we missed out on the 60s, sort of like, you know. I mean, I think there's an idea that like college is the time when we're going to participate in that same. And then we get there and we realize that we're all much too afraid to do that. I'm not going to miss class to protest something. Um, I, was, I was too busy drinking and, and having a great time. Um, yeah. And I think, like I said, I think we're just barely coming back to it. Because um, you look at you look at stuff like our big planned protest where it's like walk out of work for a day. Uh, where it's going to take another 20 years to figure out it's like walk out of work and stay away. Um, cause otherwise you're not going to change anything. You know, I think, I think we move in these long cycles and the reason we're not having sustained anti-war protests now is one giant part of it is that nobody knows anybody who's actually over there and mm -hmm. not entirely true, but compared to the original Vietnam, very different. Um, uh, part I, of it's that and part of it's, we just, we don't even know how to do it anymore. I can say the high point of my life and probably, um, the, one of the most, uh, uh, um, and probably why I, I uh, uh, started a YouTube channel uh, ended up being quite tragic, I guess, for the Turkish people. But in uh, 2013, um, in Istanbul, and also th across Turkey, like the whole country rose up, and I actually got to see a mass protest movement with battles with police and uh, 
um, uh, tear gassing and whatnot. A lot of it happened in my neighborhood, and uh, it's 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 truly an extraordinary thing to be a part of. Um, you know, maybe people should emphasize that more, man. Shit, that shit's fun, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, of course, it didn't. Well, I think it'll Gezi will end up being remembered very well. It did not have the immediate effects that was that were hoped for. Most exciting part of my trip to Istanbul was when we got tear gassed. Yep. Yep. Uh, and yeah, and I, I, I did spend about a month uh, getting tear gassed, running from cops. Best times. Best yeah. times. Anyway, uh, more questions. Not too late for that Abraham Lincoln Brigade. We just gotta find next war to send it to. Yeah, I'm not I'm not I don't I don't really want to take up arms against Erdogan. Call me crazy. Still see the poor choice. Ooh, uh, no, no, you gotta find a weaker regime. Weaker regime. Yeah, you need a weak regime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um the one other question I had taken down here was or I guess it's a two part question. First part was how old am I? Uh, which is ten days off of twenty seven. Uh, and the second was, what is the main obstacle to U.S.-Iran uh, rapprochement? The, uh, the, what? the main obstacle to U.S.-Iranian rapprochement. Uh, I would say on one side, the Muslims. On the other side, uh, the Fox News right-wing propaganda apparatus. Working. Uh, and American liberals' willingness to participate in the narratives that it creates. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, real obstacles? None. I can't, but for the first, I think probably for the first time ever, some of my viewers will be uh, happy to see this. I'll actually bring it up. Uh, IPAC, you know, um, the uh, the the I'm, I'm, I spend a lot of time in the comments telling people that the Jewish lobby doesn't explain everything, but yes, Israel and uh, 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 the the sort of uh, supporters in the U.S. are definitely an obstacle to uh, rapprochement. But I would say that the most important thing is. The uh, the priorities of the military industrial complex. Um, you know, we need bad guys. We <laughs> he said it. Yeah, uh, we need uh, we need enemies. Um, and Iran, despite the fact that they are much more sinned against than sinning in the in the in the relationship, uh, that they're, they're they're very convenient baddies. You know, they, they they say stupid stuff about Israel, about other places, and uh, or at least did. You know, with an old president, president, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it's going to be fascinating to see uh, see uh, how uh, uh, you know the U.S. Congress and uh, other lobbyists uh, hold on to their talking points about the you know Iran wants to eradicate Israel after the supreme leader dies because he hasn't said anything like that for five you know five years or so and he's about to die and they're going to basically have like a supreme leader who's dead and uh, a president who was voted out five to ten years ago. Uh, to claim that Iran wants to, you know, wants to nuke Israel. Um, uh, but they'll still say it. They'll still say it. Um, I think there's just a lot of, there's a tremendous infrastructure uh, built in terms of think tanks, journalism, fellowships, academia, built around this fantasy that Iran has hegemonic ambitions. Or, I mean, it is so transparently stupid. Like, you just need to look at things, like, very basically, like, Look at, oh, I don't know how few Shia there are in the Muslim world mm -hmm. uh, to realize that this this shit that they're talking is garbage. Um, what's what what the biggest obstacle, actually, I think, to um, I think looking at Iran rationally is actually continued warfare, um, because what's crazy is just how quickly um, Iraq, you know, more or less stabilized in the past year or so. And the first thing that Iraq's leaders want to do is get in good with Saudi Arabia. You know, we've been told um, it is true that we gave Iran tremendous influence in Iraq by overthrowing Saddam Hussein. But the sort of standard story now is that we've built a land bridge to Hezbollah and they're going to, and like Iraq's not interested in that. I mean, they've still got um, Iranian armed militias on the ground playing a part in their in their in the security of the country and they're already trying to run to Saudi Arabia they're already trying to get more rebuilding money um, so it's Iran's power in the region is actually accelerated by ongoing warfare like if if things just stopped even Assad I've read some stuff where Assad is much more interested in getting Russian money because the Russians have more money uh, but also is just much more interested in because the Iranians, to some degree, have infiltrated his country and taken over his regime in ways that he really doesn't fucking like. So as soon as the fighting stops, he's going to go try to lump more heavily for Russia than he is for Iran. Um, so this this sort of Israeli tactic of just bombing, you know, just keeping the war 
churning by you know bombing Iranian emplacements, it it's it it makes Iran more powerful. Um, because if as if Assad and the Iraqi regime are further on their sorry, maybe regime, well, I don't know. It's the use of the word regime, whatever. If Assad and Abadi are on their back feet dealing with military threats, then Iran is more powerful because Iran actually has the militias and you know is willing to send you know militias and soldiers to fight and die, whereas Russia, you know, has cruise missiles. Um, so okay. Uh, uh, I hate from a dude named Paul Hugo, and uh, I don't know anything else of substance here. A question from my sister. Cool. Go back to Turkey, wimp. Now you know all about Vietnam, do you? Oh, Paul Hugo. Well, he's not. He's Paul Hugo is perfectly welcome to to attack me. That's uh, if he starts attacking other groups, we'll we'll block him. Yeah, my sister mentions uh, Catherine Coombs, who I don't bring it up enough in the podcast. I've I've been led to I've been led to know. Uh, mentions that uh, she's read a think piece about how student debt might actually be suppressing student protest. Uh, I think that's right. I mean, I, th I think U.S. college students right now are much more delineated in their life and career choices than they were previously. Uh, I think the average college student graduates with something like $30,000 in debt. Um, and that's balanced out by people like me who are lucky enough to graduate with none, which means that a lot of kids are graduating with, with huge burdens. Um, and since 2008 into a not particularly excellent job market for college graduates. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you're much less willing to protest if you've got a hundred thousand dollars in debt weighing down on you, you know, you're much less willing to put anything on the line. I think that's very, I think that's very true. And when I was in, uh, when I was in Michigan, that was what was fascinating to me is we had this super, uh, woke left wing, um, administration. And then we had very small groups of, student protests, but like, and this is, you know, this is back in the turn of the century. This is, you know, 16 years back in terms of cost, um, sorry, 18 years back in terms of cost of college. Um, and the vast majority of the people there just wanted to have a good time, get their qualifications and get to a nice job. Uh, this idea of university is, you know, sort of development and, you know, concern and learning to be a citizen of the world. Like that's, that's long gone. Um, it's very professionally focused and has been for quite some time. Well, um, you might be happy to know that the left wing at uh, the University of Michigan right now is growing and, and uh, greater and greater opposition to the administration. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I read the daily as part of my Michigan reporting job. Uh, yeah. And Michigan won't divest. They're actually, they're on the uh, the wrong side of history nowadays. Oh, yeah, come on. Like, uh, that's uh, the whole, B uh, what, what's the acronym? It's not BDSM, was it? It's uh... Yeah, no, I think it's BDS. BDS? Oh, okay. That's funny. Well, they won't divest from oil or from Israel. They're uh, they got a better case with oil, at the very least. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's an uphill battle. Um, yeah. No, it, it it's an it's absurd what uh, some of the opponents are doing in terms of free speech stuff. Um, but uh, we we don't need to get into that in great de detail. Uh, did you see this one from Quentin Lewis Adler? Would another war create jobs in the United States? I think it all comes down to this. Yeah, I got two responses right under that that I think pretty much encapsulate the. Uh, 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 it's not much mobilized because war is a boutique industry nowadays. Um, problem being that a lot of guys who are well at least it used to be, big shots in government uh, are involved in that boutique industry. I disagree, actually. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said for the um, uh, the way that it sort of spins around. I mean, defense is currently only 5 to 10% of the California economy, but um, as with a lot of figures, um, 5 to 10% is a hell of a lot. And it's like the, the with, with economic questions, if you think about like a business, or you know, if you if you take um, five to ten percent of you know the business of a given you know business on the stock market away, then you know a whole bunch of other things become impossible. You can't finance things. You can't. Mm -hmm. um, you can't. You, you like that five to ten percent is still massive. And also, I did a video on this. I'm like, why war industries are so powerful is that like in sort of modern capitalism, we have a lot of um, strictures, some WTO enforced, some uh, legally enforced, and uh, sort of a lot of approaches, you know, with you know, maybe the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, like a lot of things that um, intentionally sever the connection between business and government 
in a lot of ways. Whereas in with military stuff, that connection is reinforced. Like there's no WTO oversight uh, or competition authority oversight of um, defense contractors because I think very rationally there's a national security exception. Like this, the the kind of like that shit. Um, and I guess this kind of gets to your point, like the kind of like batshit lunatic connection uh, between government and the military is more significant. And like the jobs that are provided um, are sort of higher value because they're always going to be there. You know, like if if, you know, uh, a soap factory or a soap manufacturer or even something much more complicated, say a computer manufacturer wants to build something in your um in your district, yeah, you're going to want to do things for them, this, that, and the other thing. But then Taiwan starts making better soap or better computers, and that factory's gone, and oh, fuck. But the thing about the defense industry is there's all of these incredible, not just, I mean, the defense department acts as your sales staff. That's what is at the root of all this stuff in Africa that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, like, you, you, that if you get a defense industry, uh, factory in your jur jurisdiction, it's going to be there 50 years later. You know, it's going to be there for the entirety of your term. It's going to fund you. It's going to put those jobs there. It's, it is reliable. Um, mm -hmm. So a, like the fact that like, yes, it's only five to 10% of us economy at this point is I think more significant than a lot of people realize is I, I mean, I spent some time as a stockbroker, corporate law stuff. It's like, yeah, you like carve off five to 10% of, at a very reliable five to ten percent of an economic entity, like problems ensue very quickly, mm -hmm. and also um, beyond that, like this defense spending that is um, created by another war, by continuing wars, is reliable, and politicians love that. Um, so yeah, so yeah. I, I would I would actually be more on Quentin's side. Well, uh, the one thing to say there is, um, uh, if you look at the textbooks uh, in economic terms. Military spending is the least efficient use of government money. Building roads, building a space program, food stamps especially. There's like way more efficient ways to uh, spend money. But uh, to Rob's point, uh, the military industrial complex is the only place where conservatives are comfortable engaging in Keynesian economics. That is government spending to create jobs. That's the only place they're willing to do it, which ends up being the place that they do it. Yeah, the the U.S. military industrial complex is uh, the most effective jobs program in history. Uh, we uh, basically uh, it's war socialism extending from nineteen the, the late nineteen thirties until today. Mm -hmm. um, that's how that is the appropriate way to understand the military industrial complex. This sort of like um, I, there certainly are sinister things like uh, Halliburton and, and Dick Cheney sitting on a private island somewhere, but like there are also tens of thousands of jobs, um, uh, not just directly in these uh, industries, but you know beyond that, um, that that rely on this sort of positioning, um, not just in the United States. Um, so it's it's something that I'm trying to deal with, and I think I'm finally going to put some stuff out about towards the end of the year. Is like how do we because we're not we're not going to get the military industrial complex to go away, go away. It's just not going to happen. Like the, the question is how can we shift it towards something that's, that's more positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, we're running up on two hours, 40 minutes. Uh, if there's any of the substantive questions in the chat, I think we should tackle those. And I think we should wrap up. I love Paul Hugo. This is, you know, ginger boy is an expert on Africa. Yeah. He's got uh, four videos which seemed to all be of his daughter. Oh, uh, well, we we'll should be able to come and read his, uh, his let's, let's, leave his daughter, let's, leave his daughter, let's leave his daughter out of it. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Uh, any questions? Oh my God. We're, we've been doing this for two and a half hours. Yeah, dude. Wow. Okay. Um, has anybody got any final questions? Final questions. I haven't really seen anything. There's, I mean, they've got their own lively discussion going on in the chat here, but uh, yeah. I'm not sure any of it's targeted our way. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess uh, final uh, final spiel, I suppose. Oh, wow. <laughs> Three cheers for finally. <laughs> Thanks, Jim Bob Lord. Wow. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
Um, yeah, final wrap up. Look, uh, I got the Vietnam series going on SFB. It's probably going to be the last thing I ever do for the show because after that it's uh, law and then I actually got to work during the day instead of uh, doing research and putting out uh, content on the internet. So if you guys want to hear about why we did this show, what my qualifications are, Paul Hugo, um, and why we still need to be thinking and paying attention to what happened in Vietnam up to the present day, uh, that's going to be coming out between now and August, as much of it as I can get done. Uh, and that's at Safe for Democracy. It's the Safe for Democracy podcast. It's at safefordemocracy.com. Uh, and it will be every once in a while on this channel uh, in this kind of video. Hmm. Um, all right. Uh, my name is Robert Morris. Uh, that's interesting that what are your qualifications uh, question from Paul Hugo. Um, I think I actually am fairly qualified uh, to talk about, um, well, everything because I'm quite arrogant. But uh, no, I mean, I, I you know, studied history and pol uh, political science as an undergrad, uh, worked in uh, inner city nonprofits for a number of years, went to law school um, at different points. I've been a stockbroker. I've been a corporate lawyer. I'm a member of the New York Bar. Um, and most importantly, I think this applies to both John and I, is that we don't work for the U.S. government. We don't work for a defense contractor. We don't work for a university that relies on defense contracts, you know, defense spending. We don't work for... Um, uh, you know, a journalistic organization that thrives on war and destruction. Um, we are legitimately independent. Um, I think both of us in different, you know, different uh, collections have uh, qualifications uh, in terms of what we've studied, where we've been. We've lived abroad, which is more than can be said about probably 95. We've lived abroad for significant periods of time, which is probably more than can be said about 95% of the people uh, opining on foreign policy. Um, in the United States, um, and but most importantly, um, we, we don't we don't work for the military-industrial complex. We are legitimately independent in a way that very little of what we see uh, in the United States is, um, and I think that's worthwhile and worth supporting. Uh, which you should support at my Patreon, uh, my Instagram at the Golden Age. I have a Facebook page for the More Freedom Foundation, uh, but of course, my first and primary product is the uh, YouTube videos that I produce every Tuesday, if not more frequently, at the More Freedom Foundation. That is a YouTube channel, Mo Freedom Foundation, where you're watching this right now. So uh, please subscribe. Um, I have a number of essays up at Amazon. Uh, probably the best and most relevant recently is uh, Everybody's Lying About Islam, which looks at Islamophobia and uh, the role of the U.S.-Saudi relationship in creating that and also covers all of these Middle East related issues uh, that we've been talking about over the past 15 years, really. Um, and uh, I do have a book, Avoiding the British Empire, which I really need to finish this week. And uh, I think uh, John is uh, kind week. enough to be uh, editing, uh, all right. editing it. Um, so yeah, I just need to get this thing done. It's- uh, I'm looking forward to it now. On my, it's weighing. I think I'm going to send you a draft probably by the end of the day, but it's not going to be. Uh, still have a number of chapters I haven't cleaned up enough for you really to look at. Um, but yeah, I guess that's my spiel. Um, any last? I do specialize in crazy hairdos. Yes, it's true. I get one haircut a year. Uh, sorry, John. Did you have a final final spieling? Uh, I got a Patreon too, but uh, now that I'm winding down, I mean. Look, if somebody wants to throw me five, ten dollars, it goes a long way here in Mexico. I very much appreciate it. Covers my beer, my beer money. Um, but otherwise, please, please, man, uh, listen to the podcast. I think it's important. Uh, I think I'm doing good work, and it's going to end soon. So, you know, if you got if you got questions, commentary, if you want to be part of it, now is the time. That's a heartbreaking. Uh, the uh, More Freedom Foundation will probably not be ending this year, though. I am going to start doing a uh, fundraising push pretty soon. I'm. Uh, uh, trying to live in the United States, uh, which uh, uh, I can't afford. I spent a lot of time in mom and dad's house. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, I think I'm I'm pretty good. Uh, how you doing? I'm good, man. Oh man, Logo Cool Extreme asks a great question. Could Rwanda legitimately have been saved with intervention? Um, I, it wouldn't have been. Yeah, uh, I think the correct answer is that it never would have been. Yeah. There's, even today, if you know, if, if Rwanda were about to start up again, it just wouldn't happen because you know we don't have bases near. Well, actually, now maybe there would because we do have Africom now. Um, but I, I, I'd I'd be really surprised. 
Actually, you know, there's a very direct question. Congo at this moment, uh, Congo is sliding in, sliding back into its sort of cycle of genocidal war that killed, I think, five million people. Um, we don't know. We have no idea how many people were killed. Uh, how much have you heard about the Congo recently? Uh, no, you've you've heard a whole heck of a lot about forty people maybe maybe dying of chemical weapons in uh, out in the suburbs of Damascus. You have heard zero. I think the Economist the Economist actually might have done a cover on it a couple a month or so back. But yeah, uh, we're 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 getting back to a Rwanda type situation in the Congo, and nobody cares. Um, I think that's um, I think Rwanda is useful for the duty to protect people as a prop that they can use to justify their intervention. As far as actually anything actually happening about these problems from hell um it's it's all it's all uh unicorn farts and moonbeams yeah and i think we can close there i think so all right thanks so much for for tuning in for gosh almost three hours uh y'all are troopers um and uh with that uh thank you very much and good evening